I'm excited to introduce you to this course, GitHub Essential Training. GitHub has become the industry standard for collaborating and sharing code. You'll be introduced to the GitHub flow, a simplified workflow that is used by companies both large and small all around the world. This course then takes that GitHub flow and supercharges it to include things like continuous integration, continuous deployment, branch protections, code review, and a lot more. This course then takes a deep dive into the command line and extends your knowledge of working with Git so you can get out of some sticky Git situations. Some of these situations include reverting past commits, resetting commits from history, locating the source of a single change in your project's history, reformatting your commits, and cherry picking commits from one location to another, just to name a few. You'll then be introduced to what inner source is and how it can transform collaboration and transparency within an organization and improve the way you work with others. This course is a great place to start with understanding the basics of GitHub. You'll see that GitHub doesn't just benefit the average developer, but everyone who is involved in the project. Before starting this course, it's important that you have a basic understanding with working on the command line, where to find it, knowing how to change directories, listing files and folders, and setting Git configurations, such as your username and email identification, for making those Git commits. It's also important that you have a basic understanding on how Git version controls your project. Knowing how file changes move from the working directory to the staging area and then committed to your project is something this course assumes you have a working knowledge of. You'll also need a basic understanding with working on GitHub. Being familiar with branching, issues, pull requests, commits, and merging are all important that you at least know how those items work together. Before we begin, I want to discuss the hands-on exercises that will be used in this course. Unlike typical exercise files that you may have noticed in other courses that can be downloaded and used to track your progress, this course also uses a unique learning platform called GitHub Learning Lab that is built and used directly on GitHub. With GitHub Learning Lab, you'll learn through issues and pull requests opened by a bot in the GitHub repository. After you finish tasks, the bot will comment on your work and even review your pull requests, just like a project collaborator or team member would. This will give you a fun and interactive way for you to progress through the course and try out new concepts all on a project repository that will be created for you on your GitHub account. To start using GitHub Learning Lab, you'll need to sign in using your GitHub account credentials. It will then ask you to install the GitHub Learning Lab app on your account in just a few clicks. When you have a course that you want to join, GitHub Learning Lab will create a new repository to work with you as you learn. These activities are all about learning by doing. After you complete a step, GitHub Learning Lab will respond to your action, provide feedback, and help you along the way. To start using GitHub Learning Lab, the first thing you'll need to do is install the app on your repositories. You can do that by navigating to lab.github.com slash install, and you'll be presented with the view like you see on the screen. You'll need to click the green button Install on all personal repositories. So by clicking on that, you'll then be presented with the screen to choose some options. You can choose to select on all repositories or only select repositories if you wish. For this, we recommend that you keep the default setting to all repositories. That way you don't have to do this each time you sign up for a new GitHub Learning Lab activity. Once you have everything set up and it looks great, go ahead and click on the Install button there at the bottom. At this point, GitHub Learning Lab will install the app on your github.com repositories and you're all set to start your very first GitHub Learning Lab activity. Today's developers are being asked to innovate faster than ever before. But they are sometimes weighed down by legacy workflows that have become bloated by business needs, technology needs, regulatory requirements, and, well, a host of other factors. It would be great if we could have a workflow that doesn't just meet your personal or organization's needs, but one that is flexible, efficient, and transparent, and, well, if anything else, easy to follow, understand, and implement. The great news is that we can take a modern approach and design a workflow that meets our needs, while adding the collaboration-rich features of GitHub 
to foster this parallel development environment, which then creates a better software delivery experience. But before we discuss setting up a more modern process, let's start with the foundational building block, the GitHub workflow. If you're new to the GitHub flow, or you're familiar with it, and perhaps you've already been using it, you can probably guess by the name. But it's a workflow that GitHub uses in their development process, as well as many other organizations all around the world. It was a simplified flow created by some developers and team leaders at GitHub to improve the way changes are made into their software project. Now, in the topic of workflows, there are so many options when using Git. It's one of Git's awesome qualities. You have the flexibility to create many different styles of workflows, but when you have so many options and ways of doing things, it can become hard to know which way is the best way. Now, this discussion deserves more attention, so we'll go over this in more detail a little bit later on in this course. But starting with the tried and true GitHub flow is where we will begin for now. The GitHub flow starts with a master branch. Now, the only special thing about this master branch is that it's the first branch Git creates when it starts to verge and control a project. Now, because of this, and for most projects, it's usually designated as the production branch. So any changes that occur on this master branch are now live on production. This branch, of course, can be really any branch. It doesn't have to be the master branch. But most projects will keep and designate this branch as the version of their project that is deployed into this production environment. Now, when it comes to making changes to your project, now whether that's a hotfix change, a feature addition, or a bug fix, it doesn't make a lot of sense to make those changes directly on this master branch that's going live to production. So when I want to make these changes, I want to make a new line of work, a new timeline, if you will, that represents these new changes that I want to make. Changes you make on a branch don't affect the master branch, so you're free to experiment and commit changes, and safe in the knowledge that your branch won't be merged until it's ready to be reviewed by someone that you're collaborating with. Once your branch has been created, it's time to start making changes. So whenever you add, edit, or delete a file, you're making a commit and adding them to your branch. Commits also create a transparent history of your work that others can follow to understand what you've done and why. Each commit has an associated commit message with a description explaining why a particular change was made. This is important when you want to look at previous changes to your project. After you add your changes in the form of commits, it's time to open up a pull request. A pull request starts the discussions and reviews of your commits. Now, this is basically you saying that you have some changes you've made and you want to add them to the master branch. You can open up a pull request at any point during this development process. Now, I've seen that a lot of people wait to open up a pull request until they've made all of the changes they want to make in their branch before ever letting others look at their code changes. I've found that it's best to open up your pull request as early as possible in the process so you can start those discussions about your changes with your team members before you've made all of them. If you need to go in a different direction, well, it would have been nice to hear that feedback before you made all of the changes in the wrong direction. We'll talk more about this later when we dive into customizing workflows. After you've opened your pull request and have received feedback and made the needed changes based on that feedback that you received, you can deploy your branch for final testing and to verify those changes in production. And once verified, you can then merge your branch into the master branch to then incorporate your changes into production. With an understanding of the GitHub flow in place, I want to take a step back and look at the big picture. We now have this GitHub flow, and it works really well. But you may have noticed that it's pretty basic. Now, having this simplified workflow is what was intended, but if you think about some challenges and requirements that may be in place for your project, the basic GitHub flow, as shown here, doesn't address some of these topics or concerns. It kind of feels like some details may be missing. For example, what if you have security concerns on who can push changes to a branch or merge a branch into master? 
What about automated testing and code checks that need to happen when commits occur on a branch? We've talked about testing on deploy, but is this something that can be done with each commit before we merge or deploy? How code reviews or pull request approvals are made? Where would those requirements and checks take place within this flow? How about other GitHub features such as issues and projects? How would they fit into this picture? Or do they? Now, this is a lot of information and things to think about, but when it comes to designing our workflows, these are some important topics to consider. Let's start with the first topic and address these security concerns when it comes to working on branches. If you're a repository owner or you have admin permissions in a repository, you can customize branch protections in the repository and enforce certain workflows that collaborators and contributors must follow. This is important when working with the master branch. Collaborators may be using the GitHub flow to make changes and then incorporate them into the master branch. But what's stopping them from bypassing the pull request step altogether and just making those changes directly on the master branch? Well, you can utilize branch protections to do just that. You can add a branch protection to the master branch that blocks contributors from making changes directly on the master branch. This is one of the most important branch protections and one that I've seen being used in pretty much every project repository that I've worked with in development organizations. Preventing people from contributing directly to master without being authorized is pretty much common sense especially if you're treating the master branch as your mainline branch that is deployed into production. You can also create a branch rule in a repository for a specific branch, all branches, or any branch that matches a specific naming pattern. Keep in mind that even though I'm talking about master, you can really apply these same branch protections to any branch. Another important branch protection is requiring that at least one approving review is given on a pull request before that pull request can be merged into the base branch. You can also add a person or a specific team of individuals that can dismiss these pull request reviews. For example, you can have a branch protection to require any branch containing the word release to have at least two request reviews before merging. Having this branch protection requires that every pull request has some level of code review and a discoverable history of who approved that pull request. This produces a deeper level of review for each pull request to make sure that the person approving the changes feels good about what they are approving. Another branch protection that I've seen in several development teams is where only specific individuals, maybe these are team leads, who can merge a pull request into master. I've seen this on teams where audit purposes or organization requirements only allow certain individuals or teams to push to this production branch. So even if that pull request has been approved and everything is ready for that branch to be merged, only authorized individuals can merge that protected branch into master. One last branch protection that I wanna point out is one that requires specific status checks to pass before merging. This requires that specific statuses are met every time a change occurs to that branch, such as when a commit is added. These automated builds and tests run with every commit to ensure consistency is met, which reduces the amount of bugs and issues that are pushed into production. CI, or continuous integration, helps automate this process and remove the human error. Status checks are based on external processes, such as continuous integration builds, which run for each push you make to a repository. You can see the pending, passing, or failing state of a status check next to the individual commits in your pull request. These status checks play an important role to our next topic, continuous integration and continuous delivery. Now, if you're new to continuous integration, you may be thinking, what exactly is this, and do I need it in my project? Well, the short answer is, it depends. But most likely, adding CI to your project is something you'll probably want to add, and it may even be a required part of your workflow when working in a team-like setting. Continuous integration, which is also referred to as just CI, is the process of automatically building and testing your software on a regular basis. 
This can vary between once a day or as often as with every commit. CI can benefit your project and change how you work on GitHub. It can help you stick to your team's quality standards by running tests and then reporting the results on GitHub. CI tools run builds and tests triggered by these commits, and then the results are posted back to GitHub in the same pull request that these commits are being attached to. So why exactly do I need this? Well, this can reduce the content switching for developers and improve consistency for testing. The goal is fewer bugs in production and faster feedback while developing. Think about it this way. With CI, anytime a commit is added to a branch, CI tests and builds can run on that version of the project and let you know if those changes in that commit pass the requirements and tests that you want to enforce in your project. This takes the human error aspect out of the equation and reduces the time it takes to check for consistency and code review. GitHub will then display the status checks, pending, passing, or failing states of a status check next to these individual commits in your pull request. If you've enabled this branch protection, the required status checks must pass before you can merge your branch into the protected base branch. You can see this information at the bottom of each pull request. In this example, our CI provider, CircleCI, has notified us that all of our tests have passed in our build for that most recent commit. Now that we've talked about CI, let's talk about continuous delivery and continuous deployment. Now, these two are used pretty much interchangeably, but when you dive into the details of them, there are some differences to what these two terms mean. Continuous delivery is the next logical step from continuous integration. Now, what this means is if your tests are being run constantly with every commit, then it's possible to release or push your project to production at any point. It's worth mentioning that continuous delivery doesn't always mean that you are actually releasing your code to production with every commit. It just means that with every commit that passes, your changes are production ready. It's more of the philosophy and the commitment that you're always in a production ready state. You can decide to release multiple times a day, daily, weekly, or whatever best suits your requirements. Continuous deployment, also referred to as CD, takes continuous delivery one step further. This is the actual delivery of these changes and updates to production. Just like other tests, there is no human interaction, and all passing tests will send a new change to be deployed into production. So why is this important? Well, with CD, it improves the feedback loop from customers and eliminates the need for a release day. One frustrating thing for developers is working on a new feature or a bug fix and not seeing it go into production for days, weeks, or maybe even months later. Now you can focus on building software and making changes and then see your work go live minutes or even seconds after you're done working on it. This is a big step in modern development strategies being able to close the gap in customer feedback, feature additions, bug fixes, and any type of update to your project is incredibly valuable to everyone involved in the process. So, how does this all fit back into the GitHub flow? Looking at the basic GitHub flow as before, let's go through it again, but this time, let's supercharge it with these additions. We'll start by adding a branch protection on master so contributors and collaborators can't push directly to this master branch. Again, being that mainline production branch. Once that protection is in place, we can then create a branch off of master, just like before, so we can work on our new changes in a parallel environment without affecting this master branch. We are then free to create our changes in the form of commits on our newly created branch. Now, this is where we can set up CI and require certain CI status checks to succeed based on builds and tests that we create. However, in order to see these CI status checks, we need to send our commits to GitHub in a pull request before these checks can run. This is another reason why opening up your pull request on GitHub as early as possible in the process is a good idea. If you wait to the end before sending your changes to GitHub and then opening up your pull request, 
You won't see these CI statuses until the end, and you may need to redo work that could have been avoided. So let's alter this flow a bit and move the pull request icon a bit closer to the beginning of our feature branch. Once we have our pull request opened and our CI status is in place, discussion and review of our changes still needs to take place. Again, all of these commits will continue to have these CI builds occurring to report back a status check. At this point, we can add another branch protection to require a pull request review to be approved before this branch can be merged. So, for example, maybe this branch protection on the pull requests says that there needs to be two approving reviews on the pull request before it can be merged in. Now, when it comes to merging, we can apply another branch protection to make sure our branch is up to date from master so we can run our CI checks again before we finally merge. At this point in our flow, we can confidently merge our code into master because we know that our branch is up to date with master. The changes have passed all required CI builds and have a passing status, and the pull request has an approving review from a team member or a designated reviewer. And if needed, this is where you can create another branch protection that limits who can merge into master. Perhaps you have a release team or specific merge managers who are only authorized to merge, and only they can merge these branches into master. So keep in mind, of course, that these branch protections are all optional, and setting them up is dependent on your business requirements and how you want to enforce your workflow. All right, hopefully that wasn't too bad. This supercharged GitHub flow extends the functionality and usefulness of the basic GitHub flow so that most needs are met. However, it doesn't end here. We'll be diving more into workflows at the end of this course and learn how we can continue to build upon this workflow to better fit some development team's needs. Now that we've learned how this supercharged GitHub flow works, it's time to see it in action with our very first GitHub Learning Lab activity. To access our first Learning Lab activity, we need to navigate to lab.github.com slash courses. Now after you sign up and then sign in to Learning Lab, you can click on this Courses tab located here at the top left. By clicking on this tab, you'll be presented with a list of these Learning Lab course activities. Now depending on when you view this course, GitHub is constantly adding new courses to Learning Lab. And so depending on where you are able to find the courses on this page, they may be displayed in a different location. But what we need to do at this point is to scroll down until you find the continuous integration with Circle CI Learning Lab activity. Once you have that located, we can go ahead and click right there on the title to start the course. And by clicking on that title, you should be presented with the course's dashboard page. Now, a lot of this we're not going to dive into as we're going to just go directly to the course and go through these steps. But there's some extra descriptions, some learning objectives there located at the bottom of this page, which we can then read a little bit more if you're curious on what exactly is occurring in this activity. But as we're going to be going through this together, we'll be going through each of these steps and see exactly how these learning objectives take place within this activity. So we'll go ahead and click on this green button, join this course. Now you'll have a pop-up that displays asking if it's public. You may have one that shows if you want to create that as private. Just go ahead and keep the default option set as public and go ahead and click on continue. Now what this is doing is GitHub is actively creating this repository on your account. As you can see, the status bar is creating this account for us. So if you were to navigate back to your actual repository, as we can scroll up, we see that this has been created for us. GitHub gave us a notification saying that our repository, this continuous integration circle, has been created on our actual github.com account. Okay, so this is an actual repository that you can access even after this activity has been completed. And as you can see, scrolling down, we have this progress page where we have a list of all of the course steps that we'll be diving into. It's important to note that we'll be going through each of these steps in detail. And a lot of this information has a lot more content and topics that we can dive into later. If at any time you feel like you can skip through some of these steps, 
you'll need to know that you have to complete these steps in order to complete the activity. So when you're ready, we can go ahead and click on the Start button to get going with this activity. Once you've navigated to the very first step on our activity, you'll be presented with this very first issue, issue number one. Now, this first issue is more of a welcome introduction. It's going to tell you what to expect in this activity, which is already continuous integration. If we scroll down, we see that there are some extra tidbits of information, maybe some drop downs. A lot of that we're going to skip for now, as some of it we've already covered in some previous videos. But also, a lot of it is just extra information in case you want to learn a little bit more about where CircleCI came from and maybe some other CircleCI providers. It's great information, and so I definitely encourage you to take some time and go through that, maybe pause this video, or when you have some extra time diving into it, because it's great information. But for the purposes of this video, we're going to go strictly all the way down to the bottom of the page where we see step number one. So this very first step is we need to enable continuous integration on the repository that was created for us. So one quick tip when working with these Learning Lab activities is I highly encourage you to create multiple tabs. Now the reason for that is because a lot of times, like you see here, we have a list of instructions that we need to follow. And this very first step, step number one, with the very first activity is it's asking us to navigate out of GitHub and sign in to CircleCI. Now, if we navigate from this tab, we'll have to backtrack and come back to our activity. So I recommend that we have this very helpful sign in link that we can go ahead and open a brand new link into a new tab. This allows us to keep these instructions with our first tab, but then also actively work through the activity in another tab that we can kind of do this jumping back and forth. So looking at these instructions, it's going to ask us to navigate to Circle CI, and then we need to, step number three, is we need to find the Add Projects option in the sidebar and click Set Up Project on our repository that was created for us, which is this continuous-integration-circle project. So if you want, you can go ahead and copy the name of this project that's listed here in step three. That way you don't have to type it out. We can just go ahead and paste that in. So now that you have done that, let's go ahead and click on our second tab, which is going to navigate us to that CircleCI sign-in page. Once there, it's going to ask you to verify your account and sign in with GitHub. Now this can be done pretty simply by navigating to this green button here on the right-hand side and just go ahead and clicking that. That's going to actively verify your github.com account with CircleCI. Now looking at my screen, you may not have all of this activity, and that's perfectly fine. It really depends on how many repositories you have and how many of those repositories actively have CI set up with them. As you can see with GitHub Teacher, there's some activity happening in our projects that have Circle CI. But for everyone, we'll go ahead and navigate to this left-hand side where you see Add Projects, and we want to go ahead and add Circle CI to our repository that was created for us. And once you have that clicked, we are presented with this drop-down where you can go ahead and paste in our repository name. And by doing so, we should be presented with the repository continuous-integration-circle where we can then click on the Setup Project button located here on the right-hand side. Now, CircleCI is going to present us with some information, maybe our operating system, what language that we want. By default, it's putting us on this Linux operating system with a Ruby language. We can really disregard a lot of this for this activity. And what we really want to do is scroll down to step number five, where we see the start building. Really, at this point, all we want to do is start this Circle CI build on our repository. And so go ahead and click on Start Building. We'll then be presented with a page on Circle CI letting us know that this build is currently running. This is exactly what you want to see. So let's navigate back over to our GitHub Teacher tab and see exactly what's going on here. And as we scroll down, we see that we have a brand new response saying that, congratulations, we've initiated our very first build on our repository. But as you probably saw right before we switched over, it failed. And that's perfectly fine because that's exactly what we want to happen, which leads in to our next step. 
Scrolling down to the end of this issue gives us the step number two, which is titled Introduce the Configuration File. And this is exactly why our build is currently failing. One of the things that CircleCI needs is a valid configuration file to be added to our project. Now, don't worry, this is by design. We purposely added an incomplete configuration file to this project in order to see how we can get a failing build to then be successful. So in order to get this build to succeed, we need to open up a pull request to update our configuration file. Now, one of the cool things about these Learning Lab activities is that some of this work is done for us. And as we see in our first activity with step number one, we need to create a new pull request using master as our base, and then we need to compare this initial dash circle dash config branch that was already created for us. We just simply need to create the pull request. Again, this is where opening up a separate tab really helps in having the instructions in our first tab and the activity in the other tab. So we're going to go ahead and hover over this new pull request and open this link in a new tab. As you can see now at the top of the browser, we have our three tabs. I'm going to go ahead and open up this new tab that we just opened. This should navigate us to this pull request that we just opened up. As you can see scrolling down, we now have a couple things that we need to fill out. One is this pull request title. Now you can go ahead and keep this as is, but know that you can completely remove this and add a new one if you want. We're then presented with the pull request body. This can be a standard template that you can have set up and where the general instructions will go that will notify your team member and other contributors what is happening in this pull request. Scrolling down a little further, we see exactly what is happening as far as the files go or changes inside this pull request. And here we have that configuration file, that .circleci slash config.yaml file. Now, if you're wondering where this came from, don't worry. This was already added to the project when you started the course. The purpose here is not how to create the file, but only that it's needed before a build will succeed. So if you remember from the steps, all we needed to do was create this pull request. So let's scroll up where we have the create pull request button and go ahead and click right on that. GitHub will now create this pull request. And as you scroll down, we see that Learning Lab bot has responded with a new message and step three to specify the Docker image, which takes us to our next step. Now, at this point, you may have noticed that this configuration file includes a Docker image to execute the build. Now, we're not gonna dive into what Docker means or what this Docker image really is all about, but just know that in order to get this build to succeed, it needs to have this Docker image so it can execute. So what step three is all about is specifying this Docker image. So scrolling down so we can see the full page and instructions for step three, it is asking us to select a specific configuration. Now in this pull request, there is a specific placeholder text, and we can actually see this by scrolling down a little bit more, and we see that it's actually here provided in this comment here in the pull request. So we can do this one of two ways. What we need to do is we need to replace this replace me with Docker image. We can replace that with GitHub training slash CI dash custom. And we can do that by just simply clicking on this commit suggestion and we'll go ahead and add that for us. We can also scroll up to the top of the page and clicking on the files change tab, we can scroll down and see this exact same response or this exact same file content here on line five with this replace me with Docker image. So you can do it one of two ways. I'm gonna go ahead and jump back over to the conversation tab and scrolling down to the bottom of our page, we can go ahead and click on commit suggestion to include this change right here in this commit. So I can go ahead and click on commit changes and we'll go ahead and add that commit directly to our pull request. Now with our latest commit, we should now have our build passed. And we can check this by scrolling down to the bottom of the page. And where it says all checks have passed, we can click on the show all checks button to see our notification that our checks have passed with CircleCI. 
Now we may need to refresh this page to get our next step. So going to the top of our web browser and clicking refresh may need to provide our next step for step four. And scrolling down, sure enough, we have our next bot response saying that now that our build has passed, we need to go ahead and merge this configuration. We can do this simply by going to the bottom of the page of our pull request and clicking Merge Pull Request. Now clicking Merge Pull Request, GitHub also gives us another option to confirm this merge. This is really just a fail safe to make sure that you're ready to merge this pull request. So we'll go ahead and click on Confirm Merge. And by clicking this Confirm Merge button, we are now presented with the option to delete this branch. Now, this branch pretty much served its purpose at this point. We've merged in the changes and we can go ahead and delete that branch. And as you can see, our GitHub Learning Lab bot responded with a new response saying, congratulations, we have now merged. So to continue, let's go ahead and delete this branch by clicking the delete branch button. And as you can see, we have a new pull request that has been opened. So to navigate there, we can go ahead and click on that link, which will take us to our new pull request. Now, in this step, we need to configure the build by adding some sort of validation to it. In this specific example, we're going to be adding a validation using Jekyll build. Now, if you scroll down to that second paragraph, we have some examples of this bundle exec Jekyll build. Now, depending on the programming language and project that you may be using, there may be some different commands that you can run. So if you have some questions or want to learn a little bit more about that, you can click on the link that's provided there in the second paragraph. But because we want to add this Jekyll build, we can scroll down to step number five, this add validation. Here in this activity, what we need to do is replace a placeholder text in this config.yaml file with our bundle exec Jekyll build text. So we can go ahead and copy this that's provided in this first step. And then what we'll need to do is commit the change. Now this is very similar to a previous step where we had to replace a placeholder of some text in our file. And by scrolling down, we can see that we can go ahead and commit this suggestion that's already provided for us. This is on line 18 of our config.yaml file. But since we did it this way, I'm going to show you how you can go to the files change tab and change this manually. So we want to change the line 18 with the bundle exec Jekyll build. So scrolling up to the top of this pull request, clicking on the files change tab, will present us with this editor view of this UI. Now to make a change in this file, over on the right hand side you have this pencil icon. So if we navigate to that pencil icon and go ahead and click on that, we can go ahead and edit this file right here within this UI. We want to locate line 18, where it has command replace me with build command. And we can go ahead and remove this and paste in the text that we copied from our instructions, which again is bundle exec Jekyll build. We can go ahead and leave some sort of a commit message to commit this to our file. Now with the commit message, we'll be diving into this a little bit later. The purpose is of this commit message is that it should be human readable. You're writing this for yourself and other collaborators. Git doesn't really care what's here as long as there's some sort of a value. So we'll go ahead and leave a message. We'll say something, add validation to file. We'll go ahead and commit this change directly to our custom build branch. Now with committing these changes, we can now see that on line 18, we have our proposed file change that we just made. And on the left-hand side, we see the image that we have replaced with line five from our previous commit. So going back to the conversation tab, we should now have a new response from our Learning Lab bot. And scrolling down to the bottom of the page, we now have a new response asking us to protect some branches. Now, at this point in the activity, we get to add some branch protections that we talked about previously. These are the branch protections that we can apply to master or really any type of branch. So scrolling down to our activity, we see step number six, protect the master branch. Again, this is where we want to protect master so other contributors can't make direct contributions directly to this master branch. So our very first step is we need to navigate to the branches section 
of the settings in this repository. And once we're there, we want to edit the master branch and apply some of these branch protections. So again, this is another good example of why you want to open up another tab because there's a lot of instructions here and trying to remember all of them at once may be a little difficult. So we're going to go ahead and keep this one here and we'll go ahead and click on this branches section of the settings to open up this new tab to our settings in our repository. And clicking on that tab, again, what we need to do is find the branch protections rules under master, and then we're gonna set a couple branch protections. One of them is to require status checks to pass before merging, and the other one is to require branches to be up to date before merging. So clicking on our branches tab, we're presented with these branch protections. Now, the first step is we needed to locate the branch protection rules, which is at the bottom, and we need to click edit next to our master branch. So clicking edit will now give us a new page where we can actually make these branch protections. And scrolling down here at the bottom, we have all of these checks that we can set on the master branch. Now, one of the branch protections we needed to set was to require status checks to pass before merging. So we'll go ahead and click on that. And what this allows us to do is again, with these CI checks, it's going to require that certain checks pass before we can merge in this pull request. And the other branch protection that we needed to click on is currently this require branches to be up to date before merging by default is checked. So we're gonna go ahead and uncheck that as per the instructions. Now we can go ahead and save the changes by scrolling down to the bottom of the page. Now at this point, because you're making these changes on your repository, you'll probably be asked to enter in some sort of a password. Now this is going to be your github.com password just to verify that you're making these changes. And so go ahead and enter in that password now. And once you have entered in that password, you should be able to have a notification at the top of your screen that notifies you that the branch protection rule settings have been saved. At this point, let's jump back over to our instructions and our other tab. Now we've followed steps one through four. The next thing we need to do is step five, we need to select the CI circle build option, and then we need to click save changes. So again, this is where we'll jump back over to our branch protections. And by scrolling down to the bottom of the page, we have these two status checks that we need to set up. The one that's asking us to do is the CI slash circle CI build. So we'll go ahead and click that and click save changes. And jumping back over to our instructions on our second tab, we need to now go in and approve this pull request. So by clicking the pull request button, we can go ahead and click on approve and submit our review. And scrolling back up at the top of the page, we see that some changes are now being in place. And our learning lab bot has now responded with a new response, a new comment, to now go ahead and fix this broken build. Now, at this point, we've added a validation. We've added some branch protections to this pull request. But if you've noticed, scrolling down, you'll see that our pull request is still failing the build. And because of the validation that we've added, CircleCI has caught that there is a syntax error in one of our files which actually happens to be this getting ready for class.md file. So our first step, scrolling up just a little bit to step seven, is to fix this broken build. And in order to fix this build, we need to apply a change to fix the syntax that is wrong. And scrolling down, we see that we have our Learning Lab bot response that actually gave us the suggestion on what we need to do to fix this change. So we can go ahead and click on the commit suggestion to fix the syntax error. And hopefully, this will fix our build. So by clicking the commit suggestion, it's going to ask us to then add some sort of a commit message, which for this purpose, we'll go ahead and leave it as is. We can go ahead and click on commit changes, and we can make a new commit to our project. And remember, by making a new commit to our project, it's going to run our CI builds again to see if everything is right and if our builds will pass. And because we fixed this syntax error, Hopefully now our build should run and we should get a successful build after it's done pending. Now notice that at the bottom of our screen, our circle CI build is currently pending. And we can go ahead and we can click on the details page over to the right. 
And it will go ahead and let's open this up in a new link to take us back to Circle CI, and we can see this build in action. So clicking on that link here, we can see at the very top that it's currently running. We have a starting time and a whole bunch of data that's informing us of what is happening at Circle. Now, just barely, we saw that it has now succeeded. And so we should be able to navigate back to our GitHub Learning Lab repository and see that the response has now succeeded as well. So let's jump back over to our tab, and we may need to refresh the page to see this response take place. And sure enough, responding, we see that we now have a green check where our Circle CI builds are presented to us on our repository. And our new step eight to merge the code now that we have a successful build. So our next step is to merge the pull request and then delete our branch since we have it now merged in. So scrolling down at the bottom, let's merge this pull request, which will then ask us to confirm the merge just to make sure this is what we want to do. And after we confirm the merge, it will then ask us to delete the branch as we don't need this branch anymore because we've merged it into the master branch. And GitHub Learning Lab has now sent us a new response to navigate to our new pull request for our next steps. So we can go ahead and click on this to get our new response. Now, one of the great things about CI, other than the validations and the branch protections that we can add to it, is the ability to add these unit tests to our continuous integration jobs that will run whenever it builds. So at this point, let's add one of these unit tests. In this example, we'll be using an HTML proofer test that will look for any broken links, images, or HTML within our files. So by adding this to our test links unit test that is already in our project, HTML proofer will test our code before it even gets merged. So scrolling down, we'll find our next step, step nine, which is to add this HTML proofer unit test. So it will go ahead and test our code to make sure it passes this unit test. And by scrolling down, we see, just like we've seen before in some of these previous steps, is we need to replace this placeholder text with the actual HTML proofer unit test. So this is already done for us, so we can go ahead and commit this suggestion by clicking on the commit suggestion dropdown, and we'll go ahead and commit these changes. And by committing these changes, because we've added a new commit to our project, remember, every time we add a new commit, the Circle CI will go ahead and run these builds to make sure that it passes all of the tests and validations that we have set up. Now that our CI build has finished running, notice at the bottom of our pull request that we now have two status checks. One has currently succeeded, and the other one, which is our test links checks, has currently failed. So we have one passing and one failing. Well, because of our branch protection, we need both of these to succeed before we can merge. So scrolling up a bit in our pull request, we get our next step, which is to fix a broken link. Now, because we just added this unit test of an HTML proofer, which basically goes through all of our files and makes sure that all of our links are valid HTML links, it happened to find one that's not a valid link. And so scrolling down, we can see that it currently resides in our index.md file. Now, just like we've done previously, we can go ahead and commit the suggestion that's provided to us from our Learning Lab bot response. So we can go ahead and commit this suggestion, which is just fixing this HTML link to a valid link. We can go ahead and click on Commit Suggestion, and scrolling down, we can commit these changes. Now remember, because we're adding a brand new commit again, our Circle CI build will continue to run with every commit that we add. Now we just fixed this broken HTML link. So at this point, we should expect a complete status check success from both of our builds. Now that all of our CI builds have successfully passed, notice that we still need to have an approving review before we can merge in this pull request. So scrolling up just a little bit from the bottom of our pull request, we have our step number 11, which is asking us to merge this unit test into our project. And the first and second steps of this activity is we need to give this pull request an approval, and then we can merge it in and delete the branch. So let's go ahead and click on this link, approve the pull request, 
to give it an approving review. We're then presented with some options. We want to go ahead and select the middle one, which is approve, and then we can submit our pull request review. Now notice it takes us back to our pull request, where we now have three succeeding checks. Our pull request has been approved, and our two successful builds from our continuous integration have passed, and we are now able to merge in this pull request. So we'll go ahead and click on the green pull request merge button and confirm this merge. And as the instructions suggest, we'll go ahead and delete this branch as well. And by deleting our branch, we now have one more final issue that we can click on for our next response. So we'll go ahead and click on our new issue to give us our next instructions. Now that we're on the final stretch to this activity, and we've already added continuous integration, our next step is to add this continuous deployment to our repository. Now, there are several ways that we can deploy our code changes, but for this repository, we'll deploy using GitHub Pages. Now, if you want to learn a little bit more about GitHub Pages, there is a link provided here in this response. But we're just going to jump right into deploying with GitHub Pages to see exactly what that would look like. And so scrolling down, we have our last step, step number 12, which is all about the deploy. So in order to set this deploy, we need to navigate to the Settings tab, and then under the GitHub Pages section, we need to select the source to Master Branch, and then we're going to go ahead and save those settings. So let's navigate back to our Settings tab. We're going to go ahead and open up a new tab, and scrolling down to the bottom of the page until we find the GitHub Pages section. Under the source, we want to go ahead and where it says none, select the master branch. And by selecting that, the GitHub Pages source will automatically be saved. At this point, we can jump back over to our instructions in our repository. We're going to go ahead and refresh this page so those settings are now in place. And scrolling down, we see that we have another response from our Learning Lab bot saying that we have now enabled GitHub Pages and setting up our continuous deployment. We also have a link where we can go ahead and click on to see what our deployed code looks like. So to go ahead and close the loop, we'll go ahead and open up this link to a new tab, and we can see what our code looks like in our repository. Awesome, nice job. We now have a working website with the information that was provided for us, as well as the changes that we've made already. Navigating back to our repository, we see we have one more remaining issue. So we'll go ahead and click on that issue, which then provides a nice little congratulations message where we have a fun little GIF animated for us with some helpful next steps. So hopefully that was a fun and helpful activity where you were able to dive into continuous integration and continuous deployment to see how those would work together in your repository. Now that we have a good understanding of the GitHub flow, and even how to supercharge it with some of the things like continuous integration, continuous deployment, branch protections, and some validations. It's time to take a step back and understand better how Git works. In this chapter, we'll be taking a deep dive in the inner workings of Git right here on the command line. And to do this, we're going to be using a project called GitHub-Games. And you can find this in the exercise files of this course. So go ahead and locate that and download that to your desktop. Once you have that downloaded to your desktop, we'll need to open up the command line. And from here, we can navigate to our project using cd desktop slash github dash games. And once you're there, you'll be able to see that you're navigated to github dash games on your command prompt. And by typing ls, you can see a list of the files and folders inside of this github-games repository. And these are the files and folders that we're going to be working with in this chapter. Now, you may have noticed that on my command prompt, you see master that's surrounded by these parentheses. Now, you may not have this. This is actually a configuration that I have added to my bash profile. And is something that is a resource also located in the exercise files. But if you actually want to see how this can be used, I'm going to cd to my root directory, and I'm going to open up Atom, which is my text editor, and the one that I'll be using in this chapter. And I'm going to open up my bash profile so you can see exactly what this would look like. 
So navigating to my Atom text editor, I have now opened up the bash profile. And this is exactly what that command prompt configuration looks like. Now, if you're looking at this, it may be a little bit confusing, maybe even a little bit scary, and that's okay. We're not diving into exactly what this means. Basically, all this is saying is that when you're in a GitHub project repository, on your command prompt, it will show you the branch you're currently checked out to. So again, if you're interested in adding this to your command prompt, you can go ahead and find that in the exercise files and then add that to your bash profile. Jumping back over to our command line, we're gonna cd back into our project by typing cd space desktop slash github dash games. Now, before we get too involved with making commits and learning some fun git commands, I wanna take some time and talk about the anatomy of a commit. Now, a lot of this happens behind the scenes in the background when you make your changes. In fact, Git is doing a lot behind the scenes, and unless you know where to look or how Git actually tracks things, you'd have no idea that all of this is actually happening. Now, the purpose of this is not to memorize everything that's going on, but to be aware that a lot of things are happening that are interconnected. To begin, when you first open up a file and start making changes in that file, Git is tracking each one of these individual changes in that file. Git refers to these individual changes as blobs. Now, I know, it's kind of an interesting word choice, but each blob is assigned its own unique SHA-1 hash ID, which is a 40 character long ID that Git uses to identify the specific blob. And as you can see, each one of these blobs has a different ID. Now, most of the time, you'll see that Git abbreviates these commit IDs to just the first six or so characters. This makes it easier for you to reference these commits instead of using that full 40 character long ID. Now, as your project commit history increases, Git may need to add another character to the abbreviated version so that it keeps everything unique. When you're done making these changes in your file, it's time to add these changes from your working directory to your staging area. When you perform the git add command to add these changes, git takes all of these individual blobs from your working area and groups them together. Git refers to this grouping as a tree, and this tree is made up of all of the individual blobs that you've added. Notice that this tree also has its own unique SHA-1 hash ID. At this point, if you were to add a new blob to this tree by staging your change, it would change the overall tree ID because the overall contents are now different. When you finally commit these changes by using the git commit command, you are taking all of the changes that are in your staging area, which is this tree, and all of the contents inside of it, and then committing them to your commit history. By doing so, it now assigns that commit its own unique SHA-1 hash ID that is made up of all of the changes that were inside of that tree when you committed. Notice that each commit references the tree ID, as well as some other information, such as the author of this commit, the timestamp, and the commit message that was included when the commit was made. So every time you make a commit in your Git repository, all of this is happening in the background with just a few simple Git commands. With understanding a bit how commits are made, let's take this concept one step further and see why commit relationships matter. Similar to how a tree refers to each of these blobs, and a commit refers to that tree, each commit has a special relationship with the commit made before it. When you make a commit, as shown in the previous image, it refers to a lot of objects inside of it, such as that commit message, the author, and timestamp, but it also refers to a parent commit before it. Since this is our first commit, the parent commit ID is blank because there is no parent commit for the initial commit. But let's say we add another commit after our first initial commit. Notice how our new commit has all of the same objects being referenced as our previous commit, but it is also pointing back to the previous commit. Also notice that the parent ID on our newest commit has the commit ID that matches the previous commit. Git is very transparent in how it stores this data, and at any time we can look at a commit and see all of this information. Let's now add another commit. Notice that it looks incredibly similar to the commit just before it. With each commit, Git has taken a snapshot of the project 
at that specific point in time, and each commit or snapshot references the commit or snapshot before it. Notice that our newest commit now has a parent ID of the previous commit. Now, why is this important? Well, understanding how commits are being stored and referenced makes your life a lot easier when it comes to making changes in these commits. If we were to make a change to the middle commit and change the commit message or the timestamp on that commit, this would change the overall commit ID to that commit because the contents to those objects have now been altered. If this were to happen and the commit ID was changed, the commit immediately following our modified commit would be pointing to a parent commit that no longer exists. This puts the project in a bad state, and anyone who has been working on this project will run into some messy and convoluted problems that need to be fixed. Now, we'll talk more about this later when we talk about dangerous git commands. Now that we understand a little bit better of the anatomy of a commit and everything that goes on inside of it, it's time to learn a little bit more about branching and branches and how they all work together. A great tool that really shows how branching works is an online tool called Visualizing Get. And a great way to get there is just by going to any online search and typing Visualizing Get in the search field. It should be the first one at the top, but if not, the website is git-school.github.io slash visualizing-git. And by clicking on that link, it should now take you to this online tool where we can then practice branching, run commits, and see how everything works together. The really cool thing about this tool is that at the bottom left-hand side where it says enter git command, so we can actually run real git commands right here within this interactive tool. I can run commits, create branches, and see how everything works together. Currently, we are on the master branch, and it shows master by that orange block that's by that green dot that represents our commit. So to make a commit, I can go ahead and type git commit in this text field, and I can see that our history progresses forward as we make these commits. So let's go ahead and type a few more commits so we can see how this history progresses. You may also notice that there are a few numbers underneath each commit circle. Those are referencing those commit IDs that we talked about a little bit earlier. Now with branching, as we're making everything on the master branch right now, I can make a new branch off of master at this point in time to make some different commits that are not on master. And I can do this by typing git branch and then the branch name that I want to create. And we'll call this one branch one. Now with branch one, if we were to make commits right now, we've only created the branch. We need to check out to this branch in order to make commits on that branch. So we need to run another git command called git checkout and then the branch that we just created, which is branch one. Now that we've checked out to branch one, I can go ahead and run some commits and see that these commits are progressing forward on my branch one branch, not on master. And if I want to check back out to master, I can run git checkout master. And now I can run some commits on master. And now my master branch and my branch one branch have commits that are different from each other. Now, you've probably noticed by going through here that there's also this green box with head in the middle of it. And if you've been noticing really carefully, you've noticed that it's been moving around as we've made some of these changes. Now, I purposely didn't talk about it because I want to talk about it after we made some branches. But now, let's run clear, which is actually going to reset everything we see here in this visualizing tool, and do the exact same commands but this time, pay attention to what head is doing. So running clear in the bottom left-hand side is going to ask us if we want to refresh this visualizing tool. We're going to go ahead and say OK. And this is going to bring us back to that initial commit on master. And notice that head is directly underneath master. So let's do the exact same steps we did previously. We first added some commits. So let's add a few of these. And notice, just like we did before, our master branch is progressing 
and our head is following wherever master goes. And at this point, we created a new branch and we called it branch one. And we can do that by typing git branch and then the branch name, which again will be branch one. Now notice at this point, we've created the branch, but head is still pointing under master. Okay, we're still checked out to the master branch and that's currently where head still is. And at this point, we checked out to our branch one by typing git checkout branch one. Now when I run this command, notice what happens to the head tag. It moves directly under branch one. Interesting. And notice with these commits that branch one has now moved forward in history and head has followed it. Now, if I wanted to move back over to master, I would need to run git checkout master. Now notice when I run this command, pay attention to what head does. Head now moves from branch one over to master. And if I run some commits on master, head now follows master when I make those commits. You can probably guess by now that head is a pointer to wherever we're working at. When we were currently checked out at master, that's where head was. When we created branch one, but didn't check out to it yet, head was still pointing to master because that's where we currently were. But as soon as we checked out to branch one, head followed us over to branch one. So think of head as your lens. It's currently where you're looking at and when you look somewhere else, that's where head will follow. Navigating back to our command line, let's make sure that we're still at our GitHub dash games Git repository. Now we can always type PWD, which stands for print working directory. Now this is a very helpful command that we can use on the command line that shows us exactly where we currently are in our file path. And as you can see, we are at slash GitHub dash games, which is exactly where we want to be. Now, at this point, we have talked a lot about the inner workings of Git, especially when it comes to commits and branches. But where does exactly Git store all of this data? Well, Git stores this in what's called the .git directory. If we type ls, this is going to show us a list of our files and folders inside of our Git repository. But you'll probably notice there is no .git directory. That is because it's what's called a hidden directory. We can type ls space dash al, which is a command that shows us a list of all of our files, even the hidden files inside of our Git repository. By running this command, we now get a lot more information. Now, a lot of this may not make a lot of sense, and we can really disregard most of this. But what I really want to point out is that dot git directory that you see third one down from the list. So let's go ahead and cd into dot git. Now if we type ls, we get a list of some of these things that may look familiar. We've talked about head, we've talked about head, and we've talked about objects. These are the objects that are inside of those commits. The tree structures, those blobs, those are the things that are inside of the objects. Now there's a few others that I want to make mention of. One of them is the config. This config file contains the configuration options that are specific to this repository. Now this is where we can tell Git to store our username, our password, for identification when making commits. Or we can tell Git to create shortcuts to specific Git commands. And this is something we're actually going to cover in a later video. It's pretty cool. The head file points to the branch that we are currently checked out to. Remember, head is our lens. It points to whatever branch we're currently working on. The index is another important file. This is also referred to as that staging area that we've mentioned. This is a file where Git stores the staging area information before a commit is made. Now, lastly, I wanna talk about this refs folder. This is a directory where Git stores the pointers to the object data in the project. These pointers are the branches that we've been talking about. Let's go ahead and dive into this refs folder. We can do that by typing cd, refs, and then at this point we can go ahead and type ls. Now remember, ls is giving us a list of all the files and folders inside of this specific directory. And the refs, as was just previously mentioned, is a reference pointer to all of these branches inside of this project. 
Now notice we have a couple things listed. We have heads, remotes, and tags. Heads is currently the pointers to all of our local branches, and remotes are pointers to all of our remote branches. Now we have remote branches, we have these local branches where head is. What exactly is the difference? So let's go ahead and cd dot dot slash dot dot. This is going to take us back two directories, all the way to our GitHub dash games. You can go ahead and run enter. At this point, let's run a command to see these different branches. We can run git branch, and then space dash dash all. Now this dash dash all is an option to our branch command, and this is going to show us all branches, both local and remote, that are inside of our project. Now it's worth pointing that we have a lot more remote branches than we have these local branches, and that's perfectly fine. We see at the top master, which for me is in green, with that little asterisk star next to it. That means that this is a local branch. We know it's local because it doesn't have the remotes slash origin file path in front of it, and that star asterisk tells us that we are currently on the master branch. This is what we're checked out to. Now, what are the main differences? Well, local branches are ones we currently work on locally. This is our machine. Our local copy of the project, but we also have a copy of the project on GitHub. That is our origin. Now, when we work locally, we work on a specific branch, and when we want to push that branch up to GitHub, we need a correlating branch or a remote tracking branch that's on GitHub that we can push changes to. A lot of times, these are going to be the exact same names. The branch on GitHub is going to be the same name as our local branch. And as you can see by running this git branch dash dash all command, we get a list of all of our local and remote branches. So real quickly, if I wanted to check out to one of these remote branches, I could run git checkout, and let's pick our shape colors branch. Now git is going to tell us that it has switched branches from master to shape colors, and it has now set up that remote tracking branch to correlate with our local branch. Now to close the circle on this, let's go ahead and run this git branch dash dash all option again. And as you can see, we now have a new local branch called shape dash colors that is now green because we're currently checked out to it. Let's go ahead and check back out to master by running git checkout master. You can see that we have now switched branches from shape dash colors to our master branch. Now, just to make things a little cleaner, I'm going to run the clear command. This is not a git command; it's more of just a prompt command, and all it's going to do is just bring our command prompt back up to the top of the screen. This makes it a little bit more cleaner to see the commands that we're running. Now, at this point, we're in our GitHub Dash Games repository, so let's start making some work on this repository. Now, one of the things with commits are commits detail exactly what's happening in our project. Think of this as a story. Every commit is like a chapter, and there's lots of chapters to this book. So, how exactly are we going to view this chapter, or how are we going to view the whole book in general? There are Git commands that can do this. One of the most popular is git log. Now, if we run git log just as it is without any options, you're going to get a lot of information. In fact, it's so much information. That you can scroll down to the very first commit that you've ever made in your project, and if you made a lot of commits, you can be doing this for a very long time. So there's some really great options that we can add to Git log to really define exactly what we're looking for, to really find what we're looking for, and to do this, I actually want to navigate back to our Chrome window where we can navigate to the Git documentation online to see all of the options that are available. Once you're at your browser, go ahead in the search window, type in git log. Typing git log, it should be the very first option that pulls up at git-scm.com/docs/git-log. And clicking on this, again, this is the actual Git documentation online. Everything you want to know about Git is going to be found here. It's pretty cool. Now this is going to detail the git log command. And as you can see by scrolling down, we have the options that we can use. These options allow us to really fine tune exactly what we're looking for, because as you just saw, running git log with no options, 
doesn't really get us anywhere. But scrolling down on these options, you can see that there are lots and lots and lots of options. In fact, git log probably has more options than any other git command out there. So how exactly do you know which options to use? Well, that's a great question. And right now, I'm going to show you some of the most common commands that could help you get exactly where you're looking for. But you can always refer back to this documentation to use some more options if you can't find exactly what you're looking for. So let's navigate back to our command line. We'll go ahead and run clear to bring that back up to the top. And let's run our first option. Let's run git log. And our first option is going to be dash dash one line. This looks a lot nicer. It's the exact same information we just saw with running git log, but it's putting it on a really nice one line form. Notice on the left hand side, we have those commit IDs and it's not those long full 40 character hash IDs. It's their abbreviated version, which is nice to see. And we also have the commit message. So if we're trying to find a specific commit based on the commit message, this could be a helpful way to do that. Now let's go ahead and add some more options. We can run git log dash dash one line. Let's also add dash dash graph. And what the dash dash graph is going to do is give us the exact same information as one line. But as you can see on the left hand side, we have this really cool ASCII art graph of how these commits were made in relation to our master branch. And as you can see near at the top, there's some deviation of when these commits were made. Those were made on different branches. As you can see, the history has diverted and then merged back together. Let's run git log dash dash one line, space dash dash graph, space dash dash decorate, space dash dash all. And what these last two commands are doing is it's essentially giving us the exact same information, but the dash dash decorate is going to show any tags that we might have applied to any commits. And the dash dash all is going to show us all branches, not just merge branches, which the dash dash graph shows. With using this dash dash decorate option, you'll be able to see any tags located inside of the history that are attached to those commits. You don't see any tags in this history, but if you did, they would show up using the dash dash decorate option. Now, at this point, we have our git log command with all of these options, dash dash one line, dash dash graph, dash dash decorate, and dash dash all. Now, let's say this is a git log command that we use all the time, maybe multiple times a day. And typing this out every single time can get pretty frustrating. It's a lot to type every time you want to use a git command. And this is where those git shortcuts come into play that we talked about earlier we can actually create a shortcut to this git log command with all of these options and create what's called a git alias that will point to this command every time we type that git alias. It's really helpful. So let's go ahead and remove this from our command line and we'll go ahead and run clear to bring this back up to the top of our command prompt. So instead of running this git log dash dash one line dash dash graph dash dash decorate dash dash all, Let's go ahead and create an alias for this. Now there are three ways that we can create aliases, three different levels, if you will. If we type git config dash dash system, system is that very first level. Think of this as maybe a workstation computer. If you set up system configurations, it's going to affect everyone who works on that system computer. So if there are multiple people working on this workstation, and you don't want to set up a configuration that affects every user on that system, then you may not want to use system. So that is our first level. One level down is going to be based on our user, and this is global. This global configuration setting will affect your user with any Git repository that you work in. So whether you're in GitHub games, as we are now, or you switch over to another Git repository, any configuration in the dash dash global will affect all of your Git repositories. Moving down to our last, we have dash dash local. Now dash dash local is only going to affect the repository that we're currently working in. So if I were to set a Git configuration with the dash dash local option, these Git configurations will only be present in the repository that I created them in. For example, this GitHub dash games. 
Now, with these Git configurations, since we're setting up Git aliases, I tend to use those on a global setting because they're just aliases for other Git commands. They're not credentials, they're not usernames or passwords. And so I feel like if I want to use them in one repository, I want to use them in every repository. So for this example, let's go ahead and run this as a global configuration. Now at this point, we need to go ahead and type out alias, and then dot, and then we can go ahead and name our alias. So for our command at the top, this git log and all of these options, we'll go ahead and name this alias LOL for log one line. This is pretty easy to remember. After you've named the alias, space, and then in quotes, you actually put the complete git command, but without the git name. So this will be log space dash dash one line, dash dash graph, space dash dash decorate, space dash dash all, in that in quotes. And I'm gonna go ahead and run that. Now, one thing to notice with Git is a lot of times it's silent on command. We went ahead and set this Git configuration and Git just responded back with nothing. And a lot of times, nothing is a success. So we can verify that this configuration was created by typing git config dash dash global, because we set a global setting, space dash dash list. This is going to list all of the configurations that we have set up globally. And as you can see at the very bottom of our list, there is our alias dot lol, the name we gave it, and all of the options that we have called on the git alias. So now, instead of typing git log and then all of those options, we can just type git lol and we get our git command set up from our git alias. Now, you can also create a git alias not just for these really long git commands, but it's also really helpful to create a git alias for the commands that you use all the time. For example, I set one up for git status. It's a really short command, but setting one up just makes it easier. You can also set one up for git push or git pull or really any git command that you use all the time just to make your life a little bit easier. Let's go ahead and type Q to get out of this log history. And now that we're currently on master, let's actually run clear to bring our command prompt back up to the top of the screen. Now at this point, I wanna go ahead and run ls. Again, this is just showing all the list in files inside of our project's history. And looking at the list of everything you see here, you'll probably notice that our index.html actually says indie.html. Now, this is a problem. At some point in our commit history, a commit changed and renamed this file from index to indie. So we need to find that commit and fix it. Now, to fix this, we need to look at our commit history. We can do that by running git log, and we can also, instead of git log, run git lol, which is our alias to see all of those options. But I'm not really concerned about the graph option right now. So let's just run git log dash dash one line. Here we see a very small and concise view of our history with that one line. We have the commit IDs on the left and the commit messages on the right. This is a reason why writing important and concise commit messages really help us out here. Now, looking at this commit history, Let's say that in a real world project scenario, you're not just looking at 15 or 20 commits. You're working with hundreds, maybe even thousands of commits. And if you're trying to find that one commit that you need to fix, it can be very difficult to find the one you're looking for. And this is where git bisect comes in. We need to tell git a starting and an ending point. So this is going to be at some point in our project history that the bad commit exists. We also need to tell git on the opposite end of our history at some point, this is where our commit history was good. And we can do this by running git bisect start. This is initiating our bisecting mode. Now, git is silent on success, so even though we don't get a response back, we can run git status, and we can see in that second sentence that we are currently bisecting from master. This is right where we want to be. Now, because of git bisect and those two starting points, I need to tell git bisect a bad commit. So I know that our most recent commit is bad. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this commit ID from our history and place that with a space on our command prompt. 
I also need to run the exact same, but for good. And I'm going to go ahead and I know that our very first commit in history is good. Now, finding a good commit may take a little bit of work on your effort because you'll need to tell Git that at some point in your commit history, that was a good commit, meaning it didn't have that problem meaning it didn't have that file change in the commit history at that point. So now that we have told Git our starting and our ending point, Git bisect will now do these revisions. It will cut that project history in half and ask us at that point in time, does that change occur? We can run ls because we're looking at the name of our files and folders. We see that at this point, it says nd.html. So we need to tell Git bisect, that this is a bad commit. Now, based on that information, git bisect will do two more revisions. Think of it as just cutting our history that we gave it in half again. We can run ls, and we can see that at this point, our index.html is correctly named. So we're going to say git bisect that this is good. And make sure to type git bisect, or else it won't work. Now, after running that last revision, we have one more to look at. So let's run ls, and we see that we have index.html at this point in time. So we can tell git bisect that this is good. And based on that last revision, we now have the complete commit ID with the author and the timestamp, the commit message. We can confidently say that with this commit, the file was renamed from index.html to ND.html. Now that we have the commit that we're looking for, we need to make sure that we get out of our bisecting mode. We can do this by typing git bisect reset. Now this is really important because if you don't reset your bisecting mode, git will think you still want to bisect. So make sure to run git bisect reset to get you back out to your master branch. Now that we have confidently located that commit we're looking for, it's time to actually make the change. Now, with Git, we can do a really cool change. Instead of just making a new commit on top of our project, we can actually do what's called a Git revert and revert a commit that is made previously and just revert those changes on top of our project. So to best demonstrate this, I want to navigate back over to that visualizing Git tool that we've used earlier. Now that we're here, you should currently see the one commit on master and that's where head is pointing. So let's go ahead and make some commits and we'll just do this directly on master. This is just going to give us some commit history to work with. So let's say one of those middle commits will actually be using the one with the commit ID B2ADB50. Now, if you're following along, your commit IDs may be different. I believe these are just randomly generated. So your commit ID may not be the exact same as mine. That's perfectly fine. So if we want to revert that commit, all we need to do is run git revert and then use that commit ID from the commit that we want to revert. So we'll go ahead and type that in B2 AD B50. Now, before I run this command, I want to explain a little bit what's going to happen. Notice that it's not going to do anything to that commit from our history. In fact, all it's going to do is reference that commit and then apply a new commit on top of our project. So let's go ahead and run this. As you can see, it referenced that commit and it now added a new commit on top of our project. And we can see that it's a revert and it didn't change or alter that previous commit. In fact, it's still there. We can still see it in our project. So let's jump back over to our command line and actually run this on our real commit. Now that we have this commit ID we're looking for, let's go ahead and revert this. Now let's run git log dash dash one line just so we can have a clear view of our history. So we can do this by running git revert and then let's copy the commit ID we're looking for, this F99C721. I'm gonna go ahead and paste that in our command line. We'll go ahead and run enter. Now this is going to open up Vim, which if you haven't worked with Vim before, it automatically gives you a commit message. Now you can go ahead and type I for insert mode to change that if you want, but typically it gives us a pretty good message that we don't need to alter it. Now to exit out of Vim, you can type colon WQ 
and that will get you out and back to your command line. So we can go ahead and type colon WQ, this to save and quit. Now that we're back in our command line, let's go ahead and run git log dash dash one line and see what happened. Notice that we have a brand new commit at the very top, 2a7baed, and the commit message is that revert from the rename index.html to indie.html. Notice that the original commit is still present in our commit history. At any time, we can go back and see that commit history because we haven't altered it. All we've done is reverted a brand new commit on top. Now that we have fixed our index.html file, let's open it up and make some changes to it. So before we do so, we're currently on the master branch. So let's check out to a new branch by typing git checkout dash b is an option to create the branch and check out to it at the same time. And then we'll name this branch change speed. As you can see, we're currently checked out to our new change dash speed branch. So at this point, let's open up the index.html file in our text editor. I'll be using Atom, so I can open that up by typing atom.index.html. Now, whatever text editor you're using, you should see the index.html file look pretty similar to this. Now, when opening up a file, a lot of times you want to make more than one different change. You may want to make a change that's regarding some speed changes to these variables, or maybe something that has nothing to do with that at all. Now, right now, if we were to make multiple changes that don't have anything to do with each other and commit those together, let's say further down the road, if we needed to revert this commit, and we reverted it, it would revert everything, maybe even the changes we didn't want to revert. So as best practice, it's good to make these small bite-sized or atomic commits. This way, if you need to go back and revert a change, there are already these small bite-sized changes, so you're not reverting something you don't want to revert if you group everything together in one commit. But committing everything separately by making one small change and then committing that, coming back to our file, making another change, and then committing that, that's a lot of back and forth that we don't want to do. So we can actually make all of these different changes at once and then use a special git command to separate them later. Our first change is going to be on line 9, where it says hashtag canvas. If we scroll over to the background, URL texture.jpg, let's go ahead and add an images folder to this texture. We'll go ahead and save this change. So we've made one change already. Our second change, let's navigate all the way down to line 78, where we have our speed variable. Where we have start 0.6, let's change that to 0.1. We'll go ahead and save this change. We've now made two changes that have nothing to do with each other, but we've made them at the same time in the same file. Let's navigate back to our command line prompt to see how this would work. Let's now run git status. We see that our index.html file has been modified, which makes sense, we just modified that, and it's currently in our working directory. Now, if I were to add this file to my staging area and then commit it, it would commit all of those changes, something I don't want to do. So let's go ahead and split this out. I can do this by typing git add, but instead I'm going to add an option and say dash p. This dash p stands for patch, and it's going to allow us to separate these changes. Now, there's a lot of information here, and we'll get to this in just a minute. But what you see in red is the file version that was previous to our change, and in green is the file version that we've changed. As you can see where it says background, URL, the green has images, the red doesn't. So what Patch is doing is it's asking us if we want to stage this particular change. We have the legend at the bottom. We can hit the question mark to see exactly what all of those options mean. There's a lot here, and we're only going to be going over, yes, we're going to stage it, or no, we're not. But know that we have several other options. So I'm going to go ahead and stage this change. It's now asking if we want to stage our speed change. At this point, I don't want to commit this yet, so I'm going to say in for no. Now let's go ahead and run git status again. As you can see, our index.html file is now in two different places at once. It's still modified in our working directory, but it's also a version of that file is now modified, but in our staging area. 
Now one more thing I want to do is we added that images folder to our texture.jpg, but I actually need to create that for our project. We can do that by typing mkdir for make directory and go ahead and name the file that we want to create. Now in my index file, I put texture.jpg under images, but I need to physically add that texture.jpg under the images folder. I can do that with git by typing git mv texture.jpg and then the new file path I want it to be at, images slash texture.jpg. Now if I run git status, I see that what I have in my staging area are the two changes that are related to each other. And what I have in my modified working directory is the speed change that I want to leave behind. When it comes to viewing our local changes, don't worry, you don't have to memorize what you've added from your working directory to your staging area or the exact changes in those files. When working in a real world project, there can be a lot of changes that are being made with a lot of files that Git needs to keep track of. Since Git is our content tracker, we can let Git do all of the work. We just need to know where to look and what Git commands we can use to find the information we're looking for. When viewing local changes, we need to think about three states these files can be in. The working directory, the staging area, and what's been committed to history. To see these changes, we can use the git command called git diff. To see the changes that are in our working directory, we can use the git diff command without any options. These are changes that we've made in our file, but haven't yet added them to our staging area with the git add command. If we want to see the changes that are in our staging area, these are changes that we've added from the working to the staging area using this git add command. To see these, we can run git diff dash dash staged. And if we want to see all the changes, both in our working directory and the staging area at the same time, we can use git diff head as the command. If you recall when we talked about head, it's where we are currently looking. So again, think of this as our lens. If we are checked out to a branch and make changes and place some in the working directory and some in the staging area, all of those file changes are in different states, but they all remain on the same branch that we're currently checked out to. So let's jump back over to the command line and run these three git diff options. Running git diff with no options should just show us the changes that are in our working directory, which should just be that speed change that we left behind. So let's run git diff and see if that's what we see. Notice that we only see the speed change as showing very similarly that we saw when we were adding in patches. So this git diff tool is purely just for us to see the content information. We're not adding anything. We can't add these changes from our work into our staging area using git diff. So this is just a great way to view the information that are in our different areas. Now, if we run git diff dash dash staged, we should see the changes that are in our staging area. And sure enough, we have the change that we've made to add the images folder to our texture.jpg. And if we run git diff head, we should see all of the changes both in our working and in our staging area. At the top, we're gonna see the changes that are in our staging area first. And if we scroll down, we'll see the changes that are in our working directory. We can hit Q just like we did with git log to get out of this. Now let's go ahead and run clear. Now that we have the changes in our working directory and in our staging area already separated, it's time to commit these different changes. We can see this again by running git status. And sure enough, this is exactly how we want it to look before we commit. So let's commit these first changes. We can do that by running git commit dash M and go ahead and give it some sort of a commit message. We'll say add images folder to directory. And now that we've committed this change, we can go ahead and run git status again. And we can see the only thing that we have remaining is the index file that is in our working directory. So we can go ahead and run git add index.html this now places it in our staging area. We can now run git commit dash m to provide a commit message. So let's go ahead and give this a commit message of change speed 
from 0 0.1 to 0 0.6. We'll go ahead and commit this change. Now if we type git log dash dash one line, we now see the new two commits that we've added to our project. Let's take a step back from the command line and talk about some git commands that we will be working with. One of the most important things to understand when working with git is how each git command affects the commits that we are working on. Since git is distributed in nature, we need to be aware of how certain commands can impact the commits that have already been pushed up to GitHub. These are the commits that other contributors are basing their work off of. In general, if a git operation will change the commit ID that has already been pushed up to GitHub, these are also known as public commits, we must be extremely careful in what we are doing and how this will affect other contributors in the project. As we learned during the anatomy of a commit, if we alter the commit's content in any way, we are altering the commit ID that will in turn affect all commits that come after it. This will leave the history in a bad state and can create a lot of problems when others try to push new changes back up to GitHub. In general, if a git command alters the commit ID, we should only use these on commits that are local on our computer. These are ones that haven't been pushed up to GitHub. Here is a list of common advanced commands that we have learned or we will learn about. A git revert, something we did not too long ago, is generally safe to use on past commits because it only creates a new commit with the inverse of those changes. Nothing was altered in the commit history, therefore it's a safe git command to use even on public commits. The git commit dash dash amend, on the other hand, is not a safe command because this command alters the content of the commit and thereby changing the commit ID. So if you need to use the commit dash dash amend option as something we'll do very shortly, make sure to only run this command on a commit that is only local. The next three git commands, git reset, git cherry pick, and git rebase, are all considered dangerous commands and should be used with caution. We'll get to all of these shortly. So let's jump back over to the command line and see this very first dangerous command in action, the git commit dash dash amend. Looking at our commit history, we can see our most recent commit, the 65B2325 commit, has an incorrect commit message. It says change speed from 0.1 to 0.6, but that's not exactly what we did. In fact, we changed it from 0.6 to 0.1. So now that I have an incorrect commit message, I can use the git commit dash dash amend option to change this. So let's go ahead and run that now. git commit dash dash amend. Now with running this command, it's gonna go ahead and open up vim, where we're gonna have to go in and make the adjustment to our commit message. We can type i to enter insert mode, and then I can go ahead and edit the commit message to where it needs to be. So I'll go ahead and say 0.6 to 0.1, and I'll go ahead and save this by colon WQ. This will save and quit out of Vim. Now that we're back on our command line, I can go ahead and type git log dash dash one line. Notice now that our commit message is correct. It says change speed from 0.6 to 0.1. But notice that our commit ID has now changed. It's now 557412D, whereas if we scroll up on our command line, we can see that previously it was 65B2325. Because we've changed the commit message, and in turn we've done it later than the original commit, so the timestamp has also changed, both of those two objects have altered the commit ID, and so now we see a completely different commit ID. Now, this is safe because we've only worked on this commit locally. We haven't pushed it up to GitHub yet. So therefore, this commit amend is perfectly safe for us to use. But if we were to push this commit up to GitHub and then go in and change it, well, we could then run into some issues. Now that we have tried out git amend, it's time to move down our list of dangerous commands and learn about git reset. The git amend command only rewrites the most recent commit. So when you want to make changes to commits further back in your history, even as far as the very first commit, you will need to use a more powerful command, 
and this is where Git Reset comes in. Sometimes we want to reset some or even all of our files from our project history. The Git Reset command has three modes, and they allow us to pull changes from history back into our staging area or our working directory. You can even reset a commit from history and into the trash. Git Reset dash dash soft moves commits from history back into your staging area. This is useful if you want to group several commits into one larger commit. Git Reset dash dash mixed or just Git Reset. This is the default mode of Git Reset and it moves your commits from history past the staging area and into the working directory. This is helpful if you want to keep the changes in those commits around, but you're not ready to commit them yet. Last, we have git reset dash dash hard. You need to be extra careful when using this type of reset because it takes commits from history and puts them all the way into the trash. This is useful if you've been testing new changes and then decided you don't want to keep any of those commits. Now, this can be destructive, so be careful when using this type of reset. So, let's now navigate back to our command line to see these three types of reset in action. To try out these different modes of Git Reset, we're actually going to navigate out of GitHub-Games and into a different project repository. So, to do that, we can go ahead and type cd dot dot. Now we're no longer in our GitHub-Games repository. We can also type pwd for print working directory to see that we're now on our desktop. So I'm going to go ahead and run clear to bring our command prompt back up to the top of the screen. Now, the project we're going to be working in is called reset-practice. And this project repository is located in the exercise files of this course. Download that down to your local computer so we can then check out to it and work in that project. So now on my command line, I want to type cd space reset practice. I should now see that I'm on the master branch of this project repository. At this point, I want to go ahead and type git lol. This is our git alias for that git log command. And running enter, I see that this project is a pretty simple project as there's only six files that have been committed to this project history. Now, this is pretty simple because I want to demonstrate exactly what happens with this reset, and it will be easy to see exactly where these files are going as they're just listed files 1 through 6. So our very first reset is git reset dash dash soft. So let's go ahead and run that now. We can do that by typing git reset dash dash soft. And at this point, we need to tell git what we want to reset. So for example, let's say we want to reset our project history all the way back to this file 4, the commit 943E6BE. We can do that by highlighting this commit ID and pasting that on our command prompt right after the dash dash soft. By running this command, we can go ahead and type git lol again, and we can see that our project history has now been reset back to this file 4. Now, where exactly did these changes go? Since we did a git reset dash dash soft, we could expect that these changes are now in our staging area. We can check this by typing git status. And sure enough, those files 5 and 6 have now been reset from our commit history and are now changes back in our staging area. So I can then commit these together. I can run git commit dash m for a message, and I can say something like add files 5 and 6. Now if I run git lol, I see that I have changes 1 through 4, just like they've previously been, but now I've committed files 5 and 6 back into my commit history. Notice that that commit ID is now a brand new commit ID that hasn't been there before. Now that we've seen what git reset dash dash soft does, Let's go ahead and do our second reset of git reset dash dash mixed or just git reset. So looking at our commit history, let's reset our most recent commit as well as our commit number four. So we'll be resetting all the way back to our file three. Now we can do that by typing git reset. And at this point, I could just copy the commit ID associated with file three, just like we did on our previous reset. 
but there's another way that I can tell Git to reset. I can tell Git to move head down certain commits. As head is now pointing to our most recent commit, I can tell git reset to move head down two spots, which will now be pointing to our file three. So I can type head tilde two, which is going to move head down two commits. Now if I go ahead and run this command, I can now type git lol, and I see that we have now reset head back to our file three. Now we ran git reset dash dash mixed, or again, just this git reset, so I should expect to see these changes in our working directory. Let's type git status to see if that's where they are. And sure enough, files 4, 5, and 6 have been reset past the staging area and back into our working directory. So let's go ahead and add these back into our staging area. I can run git add space dot, which is going to add everything from our working directory to our staging area. And I can verify that by typing git status. And now those three files have now been added to our staging area. Let's go ahead now and commit these by running git commit dash m. And we'll say add files four, five, and six. Let's now type git lol and see that we have now committed files four, five, and six together in that one commit that's now in our commit history. Let's now see our last reset in action get reset dash dash hard. Now again, be extra careful when using this type of reset because it skips the staging and working and throws those changes all the way into the trash. But let's see how this would work. So let's go ahead and run get reset dash dash hard. And just like we did with get reset dash dash mixed, I'm gonna tell head to move certain spots. Now let's say at this point in my project, I want to completely throw away my last commit, which includes files four, five, and six. Let's say that I really don't want file five and six in my project, and I want to completely throw those away. So I can type git reset dash dash hard, head, and then just tilde. Just having the one tilde will move us back one spot. Let's go ahead and run this command. So now if I type git lol, I see that head is now pointing back to file three which is exactly what we wanted. But let's now type git status. Notice that we don't have anything in our staging or our working directory. We completely threw those changes away. But wait, now that I think about it, I only wanted to throw away the files five and six. I still wanted that file four, but since it was committed with the other files, I threw everything away. Because I threw away my last commit, it included files four, five, and six. At this point, there is a way where you can get these files back, and you can do that with using what's called the get ref log. So if we were to type get ref log, we're presented with a commit history very similar than if we would have ran git lol, or just git log. We have the commits on the left-hand side and these commit messages on the right-hand side. But this git ref log is a little bit special. The git ref log is a tracker of where head has been. Now since head has been everywhere where we have been, on every commit that we've made, head has also been there, we can go to the ref log and I can find where we initially committed file four, as we can see near at the bottom with commit 943E6BE. And I can pull this specific commit out of this ref log and back into our project's history. Now I can do this with a special git command called a git cherry pick. I can run this cherry pick by typing git cherry dash pick. And then I can go ahead and provide the commit ID that I wanna pull out of this ref log. Now, since I wanna pull file four, I wanna go ahead and copy the commit from file four. And now that I have that copied, I'll put that on my command line right after cherry dash pick. Now that I've cherry picked this commit out of history, let's go ahead and type git status. Notice that our project is currently clean. Nothing is in our staging or our working directory. So where exactly did this commit go? Well, let's type git lol. Notice that we now see file four back into our commit history. 
awesome, we pulled it out of the ref log and pulled it back into our project's history. But notice one slight change. The commit ID pointing to file 4 is now different and now says 1F74B0F, whereas previously it was 943E6BE. So keep in mind that when you cherry pick a commit from the ref log, it will change the commit's ID on the branch that you put it back on. Now, the last command in that git chart that I want to talk about is git rebase. Now, git rebase can do a lot of things, but one of the most common features of git rebase is to restructure commits from one branch and apply those commits as if they were created on the base branch. So, to demonstrate what a git rebase can do, let's navigate back to that visualizing git tool that we've used before. Now, we're going to start off with this very first commit. So let's go ahead and set up what we would have two different branches and then merge those together using a rebase. So let's create some commits here on this master branch. So I'm going to create a couple commits and then at this point I'm going to do a git checkout dash b to create a new branch and we'll call this one new dash update. Because we've created the branch and checked out to it, we're now pointing under the new update branch. So let's run some commits on our new branch. At this point, let's check out back to our master by running git checkout master. Let's run some more commits on master to create that deviating history. Let's now run git merge new update. At this point, we've merged our master with our new update branch. Now, this is our typical merge. It creates a merge commit on the master branch that is now pointing to the commits that were made on master as well as the commits that were made on our new update branch. But this isn't what a rebase does. I just wanted to show this because I think it's important to see the differences on these merges. In this visualizing tool, we can run undo to do our last git command. Let's now do git checkout new update. So we're now under our new update branch. Let's now run git rebase master. And what this is doing is we want to rebase our new update branch onto the master branch. Now there's going to be a lot of movement here, but the main thing I want you to pay attention to are the commits that we've made on new update and where those are applied on the master branch. Notice that those commits from new master are sort of replaced back onto the master branch, almost like they occurred originally on that master branch. Now, this creates a more linear line in our history, which makes it really easy to view our commit history if we need to go back and look at previous commits. Now, there's nothing wrong with this merge strategy versus the other merge strategy that used the merge commit. They both put all of those commits on that one master branch. The main difference is how it looks in our commit history. So at this point, we can run git checkout master, and we can bring master up to date with our new branch so that all of our branches are up to date with each other. We can do that by typing git merge new update. And now everything is in sync on a linear commit history. Now, back on the command line, we've currently been working on reset-practice, but for rebase, we have a new project repository called rebase-practice. Now, you can find this project in the exercise files that you can download and follow along. Just make sure you cd out of reset-practice and into rebase-practice to follow along with rebase. So, let's go ahead and run git lol. We can see that this looks pretty similar to our reset-practice, but now with this one, we have a deviating history of when these files were added. We have our master, and we have this branch called rebase me. Now the purpose of rebase is to take the commits that were made on rebase me and apply those onto the master, almost like they were created on master in the first place. This will create that linear history for us. So to start this rebase, we're gonna check out to our branch rebase me. We can do that by typing git checkout, rebase dash me. And now we can go ahead and initiate the rebase by typing git rebase dash i, which stands for interactive rebase. 
and the branch we want to rebase onto, which is master. Now, this is going to open up Vim, or possibly in your text editor, some options of this interactive rebase. With this, it's asking what we exactly want to do with these commits. And as you can see, there's a lot of options that we can choose from. All we want to do is use the default, which is pick, because we're just saying we want to pick these commits from this branch and apply those to our master branch. So this is where we want it to be. So let's go ahead and colon WQ to save and quit. So now let's actually see what happened. Let's run git lol to see that we have now rebased those commits from rebase me onto master. Notice the commit history is now one linear line on master, but our master branch is now behind in history by three commits. So what we can do is we can check out to our master branch and we can now merge master into our rebase me. We can do that by typing git merge rebase dash me. And now if we run git lol, both our branches master and rebase me are now up to date and we have a linear history of these commits, even though they were originally committed on different branches. With a good number of useful Git commands now at your disposal, hopefully working locally with Git on the command line can be a little bit easier. Because Git is a distributed version control system, other contributors can pull down the project repository from GitHub, work locally, and then push up their changes, just like you. Because Git allows for all team members to contribute to the same project simultaneously, Situations can occur when conflicting changes are being introduced to the base branch. When this happens, a merge conflict occurs. So, how exactly do these conflicting changes happen? Where a merge conflict can happen is when two different branches with conflicting changes are being made to the same file, on the same line in that file, and are then being pushed up to GitHub as pull requests to then be merged in. The first of the two branches merged to the base branch will merge just fine. The merge conflict occurs when the second branch tries to merge, because the base branch on GitHub now has been updated, and that second branch trying to be merged is still comparing its changes with the old history. Because of this, the merge is blocked and it can't continue. Git needs help on knowing which version to keep, and this is where Git needs some human intervention to decide which changes to move forward with. Resolving a merge conflict may not be as difficult as you think. The hardest part is deciding which version of the changes in that file you want to keep. This may require you to have some discussions with other team members and collaborators on deciding which version to keep. To resolve the conflict, open up the file in the GitHub Web UI, IDE, or your favorite text editor, and then locate the section that has the conflict. You'll notice that the section is surrounded by some less than symbols with a series of equal signs in the middle. The second section between the second set of symbols is the section that now exists on the base branch or the branch that the content is trying to be merged into. This section is also titled with the name of the base branch. To resolve, you simply pick the content section you want. You can choose to pick the content from either branch, or you can remove everything and add something completely different. Git doesn't really care what you do, just that you tell Git what content to move forward with. Once you have decided on which version to keep, you need to remove the content markers completely from the file. These are not just helpful markers that Git puts in the file and then removes when the conflict has been resolved. If you do not remove them, these conflict markers will remain in your file. So, depending on the number of conflicts that you have in the file, you may need to do this several times if you have more than one conflict. But just remember, the process is the same for each conflict, so no matter how many conflicts there are, you choose the content you want to keep and then remove the conflict markers. So, let's navigate back to GitHub Learning Lab and go through a merge conflict activity to see how all of this works. Now that we're back at lab.github.com, make sure that you're on the slash courses page. 
This is where we can find a list of all of these activities that we can take. So scrolling down from this list, locate the managing merge conflicts. Now again, depending on when you take this course, there may be more activities listed here, so you may have to find it in a different location. But once you found it, go ahead and click on the title to bring us to the course main page. Now there's some information listed at the bottom. We've already gone over some of that. And since we're gonna be doing this together, we'll go ahead and skip this for now. So let's go ahead and click join this course. Now there's one new option that I wanna point out. The drop down that says additional options. I want you to go ahead and click that. And we have two options. These options affect the instructions that we receive through the activity. It's really cool. For this one, go ahead and click on the use the command line. And these instructions will now tell us how to resolve these merge conflicts using the command line, which is really cool. So let's go ahead and hit continue. GitHub will now create this repository on our personal github.com account. So it may take a few seconds. It's okay, just be patient and we'll be able to get going here in just a few seconds. Now once this creates, it will navigate us to the course dashboard page. Now from here we can see a list of all of the steps. This one currently has a few steps to go through. We'll go ahead and scroll up to the top and click start to get going. Now the first thing we need to do is scroll down past all of this information. It's basically telling us how conflicts happen, how to resolve them, and we've already gone through all of that. So where I want to navigate to you are the instructions on how to get going with this first activity. Now, there's a lot of instructions, especially for this activity. And as we go through, you'll notice that there's a lot of things that we need to type in the command line. So as best practice when working with Learning Lab activities is to keep this open in a tab to constantly go back to it to see what steps we need to take. So real quick, to get started, we wanna clone this repository down, as we can see as our first instruction listed on step number two of the activity. We then wanna CD into that repository, check out to the branch change skills, and then we're going to make a quick change in the data skills.yaml file. And once we do that, we're gonna push that change up to GitHub, and then we'll click on this really handy link that will create a pull request for us. So let's go ahead and navigate to the command line where we can run through these steps. But first, let's go ahead and copy this first step so we don't have to type that out. Let's go ahead and copy as it's shown there. Now, navigating to our command line, let's go ahead and type git clone, or you can go ahead and paste in that URL that you copied. This is going to clone down this repository to our local computer. Now make sure that you've navigated to the spot where you wanna clone this down. I'm currently at my desktop, and that's where I'll clone this down for now. So if you wanna clone this into a different directory, make sure you navigate to that directory before you clone it. So now we can CD into our merge conflict repository, and now we'll see that we're currently on our master branch. I wanna go ahead and run git checkout dash b to create a branch, and I'm gonna call this one change skills, as was directed in our instructions. Now that we've created this branch and checked out to it, let's go ahead and open this branch up using our text editor. I'm gonna go ahead and run this in Atom, and we'll open up our data, underscore data slash skills dot YML for YAML. And this will open it up in our text editor. So in the instructions, we needed to go ahead and add some sort of a skill to this page. Now you can add anything here. It doesn't have to be exactly what I type. In fact, you can actually make this more of a resume style if you'd like, and then move forward with this repository even after this activity has completed. But we'll just do something fun for now. We'll say development. We'll go ahead and capitalize the D for consistency. And let's add a skill. And we'll call this one Git and GitHub. And let's do a description. And we'll say taking courses on LinkedIn learning. All right. So let's go ahead and save this file. Now jumping back over to our command line, we've now made a change. So let's go ahead and run git add to add it from our working to our staging area. So we can go ahead and add this file that we've already made modifications to. 
Now that we've added that, let's go ahead and run a git commit, dash m for a message. We'll say add new skill. Now that we've added a commit, let's go ahead and run git push. Now we want to push this up to GitHub. Interestingly enough, we get a different message saying that git push needs to have an upstream. And this is fine. We didn't do anything wrong. What we need to do is we need to set that tracking branch up on GitHub. So we can go ahead and copy this directly from our command line and go ahead and set up that upstream to GitHub. Now this may prompt you for your github.com username and password. So go ahead and type that in if you are prompted. And once you have those entered into your command line, Git will now go through some more information and then it will push those changes or that change up to GitHub. So let's go ahead and navigate back to our repository on GitHub. And we may need to run a refresh to see exactly what's happening. Now let's go ahead and click on this create pull request button. We'll open this up in a new tab. And as we scroll down, we can see the changes that we've made here in the GitHub UI. Let's go ahead and finish the instructions by clicking on create pull request. Now that we've created our pull request, let's scroll down and see what the next instructions are. So scrolling down, we see we have step number two that's going to talk about merging this pull request. So at the bottom, we have our activity instructions. So just like that first activity, we have a few instructions we need to navigate back to our command line to run these and actually merge this up. Now, I could just scroll down and click that green merge pull request button, and I can do everything right here in the GitHub UI. But since we want to do this on the command line, we have the instructions on how to do it by navigating back over to our command line. So we want to check out to master. We want to run a git pull to make sure our master branch is currently up to date. It's best practice to pull every time you're working on a branch. Then we want to run git merge change dash skills. This is the branch that we have created. And then we'll push this back up to GitHub. So let's go ahead and run these commands. I'm going to go ahead and run clear just to bring our command prompt back up to the top. So let's go ahead and run git checkout master. Now that we're on master, as best practice, let's go ahead and run git pull. And as you can see, everything says we're up to date. So we're exactly where we want to be. Now let's go ahead and run git merge. And then we want to merge our change dash skills branch into our master branch. Now that we've done that, let's go ahead and push up these changes up to GitHub. And it may take a couple seconds as Git is running through all of the backend work. And now let's navigate back to GitHub. And as we scroll down, we see that everything was automatically merged in. Very nice, it updates in real time. So let's go ahead and navigate to our next pull request to see our next steps. Now that we're on our new pull request, it looks like we need to resolve a simple conflict. So let's scroll down to see exactly what's going on here. Again, we have a lot of information with some instructions on exactly how to resolve this. But scrolling down to the bottom, we see that we can't merge this pull request. Even as many times as I try to click this, it's not going to let me merge. In fact, it's completely grayed out. So Git is telling me that we have a merge conflict that needs to be resolved before we can try to merge this in. Now, there are two ways that we can resolve this merge conflict. I can use the web editor on GitHub by clicking Resolve Conflicts here on the right-hand side. Or I can use the command line, which is what we set our instructions to, so we'll go ahead and follow those instructions. So scrolling up, I can see the list of instructions we need to take to resolve this merge conflict. Now, I know this may look a lot, but a lot of it is talking about those merge conflict markers, which we've already discussed, so it shouldn't be too bad. So we need to check out to the branch in question, which is update-config. Then we'll need to pull down to make sure we have an up-to-date copy of that project. And then we need to run git merge into master. The reason we need to run git merge to master is we need to initiate that merge to get the merge conflict. And once we do that, we can open up the file in our text editor and do the steps that we've talked about before. Find those merge conflict markers, remove those, choose the content we want, and then we'll add those changes, commit it, and push it back up to GitHub. All right, it seems like a lot, but let's go through it together. So let's navigate back to our command line. And remember, the first thing we needed to do 
is we need to run git checkout to the branch in question, which was update-config. Now, as best practice, let's run git pull just to make sure everything is up to date, and that's what we see. So we need to initiate that merge by running git merge master. Now we see that we have a conflict. Git tells us there's a merge conflict in this underscore config.yaml file. So we need to go ahead and open this up in our text editor. Again, I'll be using Atom, but any text editor will work. So let's go ahead and copy this and open this up in our text editor. Now, you'll be able to scroll through the file to see where these conflict markers are at. And as you can see, they're right here between lines 13 and 29. So now that we've located these conflict markers, we need to choose which version file we want to keep. I can choose the content that's in our head or the branch we're currently checked out to, or I can choose the content that's in master, which is that lower section. So for this, I'm going to decide, and this is where discussion probably needs to take place, but to move forward, we'll say we're going to keep the content that's in our head branch. So we need to go ahead and remove everything that is showing here in master. That's our first step. And then lastly, we need to make sure to remove these conflict markers. Again, if we fail to remove these, they actually remain in our file. So we'll go ahead and save those changes and go back to our command prompt. Now at this point, let's go ahead and run git add and add this file from our working to our staging area. So I can go ahead and just copy that from our last command that we ran. Now that we've added that, I want to go ahead and run git commit and we'll give it a commit message. For this one, we'll say merge update-config into master. And finally, let's go ahead and run git push to push our changes up to GitHub. Now, anytime you push or pull, if it's bringing information down, it may take a couple seconds, but it looks like that completed. So let's jump back over to our GitHub repository and see exactly what changed here. So now we have a new response that's asking us to merge our resolved pull request. So I can scroll all the way down and see that our merge pull request is still grayed out, but it's not because there's a conflict, it's because we have that branch protection of having that approval. So I can go ahead and run this merge locally, and our Learning Lab bot should go ahead and approve this pull request for us. So let's navigate back to our command line, and let's merge this locally running git checkout master, and then git pull, and then we'll run git merge update-config, and then we'll push that up to GitHub. So let's navigate to our command line, and let's check out to master. Now that we're on master, let's run git pull, just to make sure everything is up to date. And then we'll initiate our merge by saying git merge update-config. All right, and now we'll push this back up to GitHub, and now that that has completed, let's navigate back to our repository and we'll scroll down and we can see that it was automatically merged locally, as we can see the message at the bottom, and we can now navigate to our next pull request. Now, this next pull request is asking us to create our own conflict. So remember, these conflicts arise when we have two branches that introduce these conflicting changes. So let's see what this activity is asking us to do. As we scroll down, we see that we have an activity to make changes on our branch, this pull request. So let's check out to add-education, and we'll open up the underscore data slash education.yaml file in our text editor, modify some of the contents, and then we'll stage this by running git add, and then we'll commit it and push these changes back up to GitHub. So let's go ahead and navigate back to our command line and go through these steps. Now I'm going to go ahead and run clear just to bring my command prompt back up to the top. So we needed to run git checkout add-education. And now that we're on our branch, we can go ahead and run git pull just to make sure that everything is up to date. Now that we're all set, we can run Atom or your text editor, and we need to open up the underscore data slash education dot yml. So now that we're back on our command line, we needed to modify some of the contents in this file. Now you can choose which one of these you want to modify. I'm going to modify line three, and instead I'm going to say linked in 
learning. And we'll go ahead and save that. All right. Now let's navigate back to our command line. And now that we've modified the file, let's go ahead and run git status. And as you can see, that data slash education.yaml file is in our working directory. So let's go ahead and stage this by running git add. And then we'll add this file from our working to our staging area. And we can also run git status again to verify that those changes have now taken place. Now that we're all set, let's run git commit dash m. And we'll say update uni in education dot yaml file. All right, and let's go ahead and run git push to push those changes up to GitHub. Now at this point, let's navigate back to our repository because we probably have some new instructions. And scrolling down, we may need to refresh. Oh, there we go. And some more information. It's asking us now to navigate to this second branch. Remember the merge conflicts happen when two branches have those conflicting changes. So let's click on this number three, which is basically acting like our team members pull request. So these instructions are asking us to come in and approve this pull request. And I can do that at the top by clicking add your review. And we'll go ahead and click on approve and submit our review. As the branch protection is set up that we needed to have an approving review before these pull requests can get merged in. And let's go ahead and our learning lab bot went ahead and merged in that pull request to simulate our team member now that has an approving review could then go in and merge that pull request. So we can navigate back to our pull request through this link and we should now see that we have a conflicting change. As we scroll down, if we tried it to merge at this point, we have a conflicting file. Now that our pull request has a merge conflict, let's go ahead and resolve it. We need to resolve the conflict in this underscore data slash education dot YAML file. Now, the instructions is we could pull this down and resolve it using the command line. But since we've done that already, I want to quickly show you how you can do this right here within the GitHub web UI. We can do this pretty simply by at the bottom of the pull request, clicking Resolve Conflicts. And this is going to open up this text editor view right here within the web UI. Now, notice we still see those conflict markers. Everything looks pretty similar to where we saw it on our text editor. So here we need to choose which version we want. Do we want the version that's in our head or our pull request, which is add-education? Or do we want the version that's in master? Well, master has a lot of changes. And so after discussion, let's go ahead and keep those. So the first thing is to remove the content that we don't want and then remove all of these conflict markers. Now that we have the file looking how we want it, let's go ahead and mark as resolved at the top right hand corner. And we can go ahead and click the commit merge button. Now clicking that is making a commit on our project to resolve the conflict. So now we can scroll down to the bottom of our page and we can see that the next steps we have is to merge in this pull request. Now we have that branch protection, so we can't merge quite yet because we're still waiting on that approving review. So what we can do is let's refresh this to see if our learning lab bot will give us the review. And sure enough, we got that review. So as we've gone through previously, that we can go back to our command line, check out to master, do git pull to make sure we're up to date, run git merge add dash education, and then run a git push to push up those changes to GitHub. Or I could go down and just click this merge pull request button. I'm going to confirm the merge. And essentially, I'm doing all of those git commands right here within the GitHub UI. To find our next conflict, let's click on the link that's provided in our last response. And this will navigate us to our last pull request. And this is to resolve a set of conflicts that we have in this pull request. And scrolling down, we have a list of these instructions. And if we go to the bottom of our pull request, we see that again, we can't merge because we have conflicting files. But now we have two conflicting files, not just one that we've seen before. But don't worry, remember, resolving these merge conflicts are exactly the same. We'll just need to open up these files one by one, resolve the conflict, and then add those changes. So scrolling up to the top of our instructions, 
we need to check out to the branch add-experience. We'll run a git pull to make sure we're up to date. And then we need to initiate that merge by running git merge on master. And at this point, we'll open up each of these files in our text editor, resolve the conflicts, add those from our working to our staging area, and then we'll commit these and push up to GitHub. All right, it seems like a lot of steps, but we've gone through all of these before. So let's see how it works one more time by navigating back to the command line. So I'm gonna run clear just so we can start with the fresh screen. Let's do git checkout add experience. Now that we're on our branch, let's run git pull. We see that we had some changes in pulling into our branch, which is perfectly fine. Let's run git merge master. And here we see we have initiated that merge conflict. We have the two files in underscore data slash interests dot YAML and underscore data slash experience dot YAML. So we need to open up each of these files in our text editor to resolve those conflicts. So I can type Adam and we'll do this experience one first. Go ahead and highlight that and navigate over to our text editor to resolve the conflict. Now, looking at this file, we have a lot going on here. And this is an example of sometimes that we have multiple conflicts in the same file. So here's one from line 22 to 34. There's one conflict. And we also have one from line 2 to line 14. And there's another conflict as well. So we just need to figure out which content we want to keep remove those conflict markers, and then we'll go ahead and add this file. So with our first one, again, it's completely up to you which ones you wanna keep. We'll say on this one, we wanna keep what's on master. So let's go ahead and remove everything in our head branch and remove that last conflict marker. And so that first one looks great. Our second conflict is support cat and intern. We need to choose which of those sections we wanna keep. This one, let's decide we want to keep what's on our branch. So we'll remove everything that's currently on master. And then we'll remove those conflict markers. And clean up the file just a little bit. All right, that looks great. Let's go ahead and save that. So we can navigate back to our command line. And let's run git add and add this file from our working to our staging area. And lastly, let's open up our data slash interest file so we can resolve the conflicts in this file. So I'll go ahead and open this one up in Adam as well. And here, this one looks a little bit different. That is because this is showcasing that if you leave your conflict markers in your file, they remain, and then it makes it really hard to see what's going on, especially if you have a conflict. So here we have head, and then we have some conflict markers that were left, and then we also have exactly what's going on here at the bottom. So it may be a little difficult to see what's going on here, but we can see that this was a conflict marker that was left before. And looks like this was a conflict marker that was left before. And we can go ahead and choose which content we wanna keep here. Now I'm gonna choose what's in head, so I'm gonna remove everything that's in master and remove that middle conflict marker, our master marker, just clean this up a little bit and remove our head at the top. Now, again, the whole point of these conflicts is that you have the file looking exactly how you want it when you commit. So if you need to move things around or add new content, that's perfectly fine. Git just needs to know what content we want to move forward with. So we'll clean this up by removing some of these blank lines. We'll save this file and go back to our command line. Let's now run git add and we'll add our data slash interest.yaml file from our working to our staging area. Now let's run git commit, and we'll have a commit message. We'll say merge master into add experience. And let's go ahead and push up these changes to GitHub. Now that we've pushed up these changes, we can navigate back to our repository on GitHub and see if those changes took place. As you can see, we have a brand new response asking us to merge in this pull request. So let's go ahead and run this one more time using the command line instead of clicking the really easy green button here on the pull request. So we'll go back to our command line, we'll check out to master, we'll run git pull to make sure everything is up to date. 
We'll run git merge add dash experience, and then we'll push this all up to GitHub. So we'll run clear just so we can have a fresh screen. Let's run git checkout master, and we'll run git pull. And now let's run git merge add experience. And it's asking us if we want to have some sort of a commit message. This is exactly what we want. You can change this if you'd like. But to get out of this mode, colon WQ to save and quit. And now let's run git push to push these changes up to GitHub. And now that that data has been sent up, we can navigate back to our repository. We can see that we have merged. And we have one more final issue. We can click there in our comment response. And we see we get this congratulations image. And we can scroll down and see what we did well, some learning objectives, and that you can pat yourself on the back for going through some really cool merge conflicts. Great job. When it comes to merging your branch into another branch, there are a few different types of merge strategies that you need to be aware of that can occur when you merge your branches. Two of the main types of merges with Git are a fast forward merge and a recursive merge. The merge outcome is the same between the two as far as the content that is added to the base branch. But what changes is how those commit contributions look in the project's history. With a fast forward merge, the commit history is one linear line. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. We created a branch off of master, so we have a history that has deviated. Well, that's true, but when we merge our branch into the base branch with a fast forward merge, there are no new commits that have been added to master since we created our branch. So the merge basically just performs a fast forward to where the branch is currently at to include the changes. Because of this, there is no merge commit in our history when these branches are merged together. One example of a fast forward merge is rebasing. If you remember when we rebased, we took the commits from one branch and applied them to the base branch as if those commits occurred in one linear line without that merge commit. With a recursive merge, after you've branched and made some commits, some new commits have been made to the base branch. This now has a true deviating history, with each branch having new commits that the other isn't aware of. So when it's time to merge your branch into the base branch, Git recurses over the two branches to merge them together. By doing so, Git needs to create a merge commit on the base branch as part of the recursive operation. This merge commit now has two parent commits as it points to two different commits from separate branches. Now, there's nothing right or wrong with these two different types of merge strategies. The main thing is how these merges will appear in your commit history. If you have a preference, as some developers do, and some really do, you can force Git to perform a specific type of merge, even if the situation would default to the other merge. If you want a fast forward merge, you can use the git rebase command as was previously used and mentioned. If you want a recursive merge, in your commit history, you can tell git to do so by using the git merge dash dash no dash ff command when performing the merge. That stands for no fast forward. This will create the merge commit on your base branch, but may only have that one parent commit on it instead of the two, depending on if the base branch has new commits or not. Again, these merge strategies don't really affect your in product workflow, because the merge happens regardless. But it's important to understand these merge strategies when thinking about your workflow and how your commit history will look. If you want it to look a specific way, you'll want to include this in your documentation or contribution guidelines when discussing your workflow for team members and contributors to follow and understand. Putting merge strategies aside, let's talk about branching strategies and the branching model. Hopefully by now, you're realizing that Git gives us a lot of freedom and flexibility in how our projects look. Because of this, some organizations new to Git with no defined strategies to begin their project with find that their history, workflows, and repositories can quickly become a mess or convoluted. One workflow and branching model that has been around for a while is called the Git flow. The difference between this flow compared to the GitHub flow 
is the number of long-lived branches with this type of workflow. The biggest problem with long-lived branches is that many of them emerge to only contain part of the changes that are occurring. It's hard to figure out which branch has the latest updates or code changes, or which one is the mainline branch we deploy to production. In fact, workflows like this often have helper scripts that are created just to enforce the rules on which branches can be merged into other branches. And, well, this gets confusing. As a general best practice, it's good to reduce the amount of long-lived branches to keep your workflow as efficient and simple as possible. Now that I've mentioned merge strategies and the potential pitfalls of working on long-lived branches, I want to return to our supercharged GitHub workflow and fine-tune it even more. Currently with our GitHub flow, everything is happening on our one master branch, with our feature branches coming from the base branch of master. Some questions that you might get are, it's too simple. Our workflow is complicated. The enterprise world can be even more complicated, and our teams need more control. So to address this, let's take the GitHub flow where we are now and add an additional layer. One development team noticed that the mainline master branch is fine, and the feature branches are great as well, but we want more control on when we merge into master. We want to protect our master branch as usual with branch protections, but we don't want anyone to merge into master on their own account. We want to have a code freeze to occur whenever we push to master. For this scenario, we can fine tune our GitHub flow to have a development branch along with master. What this can do is allow developers throughout their sprints and development cycles where they can branch off of this development branch as their base, make their commits on their own branch, and then merge back into develop with all of the CI checks, protections, code reviews, and merging strategies that exist on the develop branch. Once developers merge into develop and they're at the end of their sprint, a release manager will go ahead and perform a code freeze and create a pull request at this specific point in time from the develop branch onto master to then deploy into production. At the same time, although it's called a code freeze, developers can continue with their next sprint on the develop branch and continue to branch off of develop again and make commits for new features. This is a good example of how you can take the GitHub flow and fine tune it to better fit your needs. The important thing is to make it a workflow that works for you and your organization's needs. We've learned a lot about different workflows, branching models, and merge strategies. But ultimately, every organization is different. And although the supercharged GitHub flow works for a lot of projects and organizations, you might have different requirements that can't be met exactly with the GitHub flow as we've seen here. As best practice, I recommend you try to get as close to the GitHub flow as possible, but it really comes down to having those discussions with your team and those decision makers to talk about what will work for you. If you're looking at where to begin, here are some great topics and questions to think about and discuss with your team as you establish your ideal process. This is definitely not a complete list of questions, but just a few to get things going. So one question could be, which branching strategy will you use? Bring to the table the refined and supercharged GitHub workflow and see if that works for you and your team. Which branch will serve as your master or deployed code? Again, master was created by convention with Git. It doesn't need to be your mainline branch that is deployed to production, but I recommend you pick one or as few as possible to be long-lived branches. How will you protect your code? Think about those branch protections. How do you want to protect the master branch? Do you need pull request reviews, required CI tests and builds? Do you need to have an authorized team member to merge or can anyone merge with a pull request approval? Will you use naming conventions for your branches? A lot of development teams I've worked with have specific naming conventions for creating branches. This helps identify which branch is doing what changes or updates in your project. Is this something that needs to be identified in your workflow? How will you use labeling? Think about issues and pull requests. You can create labels and assign teams and individuals to them. What labels need to be created? How will you indicate sign-off on pull requests? Will you teach your workflow to your team? If it already exists, 
How is it taught to new hires? Can this be easier? What integrations will be used in different stages of development? Will all teams be using the same tools, or will that change between teams? If users have questions about Git and GitHub, or their workflow, who can they ask? How do they know who to ask? Do you have a contribution guideline for your repositories? These are just some of the important questions to ask yourself and your team when it comes to designing a workflow that best fits your needs. Now, a lot of these questions can't be answered overnight, and they may require some deep team discussions, maybe even case studies, and looking at what has worked and what hasn't worked in the past to decide on a best path forward. The important thing is that these discussions are being had, and action is being taken to improve and refine your current workflow. Other than some of the questions on the list for workflow design that we just went over, most of the workflow challenges we've talked about have been technical challenges around designing a workflow. Although these are key for having a working workflow, some of the biggest challenges can be around cultural transformation. When I talk about this cultural transformation, I'm mostly talking about communication, and more specifically, communication across teams within your organization. Let's understand how this can be an issue and what we can do to improve it. If we look at something like this image, it's pretty standard. We know exactly who's accountable for what job. They have one manager, and it's clear and satisfying because we have a good idea of who's accountable for what. But even in a model of this size, it's not without its challenges. While sharing the vision is pretty straightforward from top down, from the bottom up, once we get into the weeds and details of the project, that vision can be lost pretty quickly. If we think about it from a software perspective, developers in general depend on the work of other developers. This is a major benefit to open source code and projects, and many times, this can be geographically distributed in different places. So, as we see in this image, with an organization with many teams, more managers are needed to get involved and more people to manage other teams. And so we find ourselves many times creating structures based on responsibilities, business units, geography, and function areas. And when this happens, and I have bet you've seen this somewhere before, silos start to break off. And because of this, there can be lost development time and confusion on what other teams are working on. One example occurred during a workflow consultation with the team where GitHub brought in leads from two different development teams to see what the different types of workflows existed in that company. It's not uncommon to see various different workflows across different development teams, but what they found was that these two development teams had created the same JavaScript framework. What ended up happening was not only lost development time between these two teams, but now they're in the uncomfortable position of deciding which one is better than the other. Going back to our chart, let's say that this yellow developer at the top left needs to talk to the green and blue developers, or that they're trying to solve the same problem. As an organization gets more complex, it can get confusing on who someone needs to talk to for specific information. Now, this can go a couple of ways. These developers can act without knowing what to do or who to talk to, or since they don't have all of the information they need, they simply don't act at all. Naturally, what tends to happen is this developer will go to their manager, and hopefully the manager will do a call out to other managers, who can then ask their teams, hoping that the right developer heard and that they can respond back to the original developer. As you can probably imagine, this is not a great way of communicating important information across teams within an organization. Looking at this chart, it's probably more similar to what a lot of us are used to. So now if the yellow, green, and purple developers need to talk to each other to discuss certain features and code changes, it can become extremely difficult knowing who to talk to, which teams have the right information, and how to best move forward. This can quickly become a game of where's Waldo. Imagine trying to get to the needed information in an organization like this where teams are siloed and there isn't an organized and standard way of communicating with each other across teams. It sounds incredibly frustrating, 
and a lot of organizations actually function this way, even if they think that they don't. So how can these developers find each other in an organizational chart that looks like this? Unfortunately, when we have developers that are working on the same thing, not only is there lost development time, there's also a real cost to bugs, delays, and possible security events. So how can we start to fix these issues? Well, adopting an open source culture where anyone can view, use, and contribute to the project inside your own organization is the first step to adopting this inner source culture. Adopting an inner source culture, as with most things, takes some time. We've seen the pitfalls that occur with siloed work within teams in an organization. So what can we expect to see improve in our organization as we increase transparency and visibility? Well, a few of these items are open collaboration encourages more contributions. Teams can more easily innovate, and with more people inspecting code for errors and inconsistencies, they can build secure, more reliable software. Problems are more easily found and fixed before heading into production. Developers don't always have to start from scratch. Anyone can discover and reuse open source projects for nearly any reason. People can even use them to build other things or modify them to suit their specific needs. Similar to this, inner source code helps your team discover, customize, and reuse existing internal projects. They can also establish and build on a shared set of documented processes to optimize the way your company deploys and uses software. Transparent decision-making builds processes, trust, and alignment. Now, opening up your projects brings a new level of transparency into your organization. Not only is the code visible, but also the process and decision-making behind it. Well-documented conversations help developers on distributed teams get up to speed and start building. And with the work happening in the open, collaboration can also include project managers, designers, security teams, and anyone who's involved in the project. The slow systemic practice of gathering requirements, holding meetings, and developing in silos is not in step with the pace of technology today, or even in the pace of our customers' demands. InnerSource helps teams build software faster and work better together. This results in higher quality development and better documentation. Now, the key is to find where your organization falls short and then identify and establish solutions to remove these structured silos so information is easily available and discoverable across the entire organization.